even call the meeting to order, um, we can have the solar presentation. Okay. We're sitting here anyway. Okay. You ready? Sure. Okay. Yes. Which glasses do I need? <laughs> <laughs> well, the sad thing is now, even today, I was up at Lee's Egg for, our, we have our annual meeting on Veterans Day, and so I sat up front, so I figured, oh, great, I won't have to use my glasses. So I was like, oh, shoot, I didn't have your glasses out. <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> so my name is Adam Wiggett, and I'm here to a solar array for the Green Tree School. <coughs> and here is a little bit of information. So can you just take one and pass it sure. around? Well, probably I should have to keep one of them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. So my goal today is to uh, answer any questions you guys have about it and get an idea of whether you guys think it's worth it to, to build a system. Um, so um, we are currently spending uh, over $1,600 a month in electricity at the Brain Tree School. That's the average for the year. Um, <coughs> Installing a solar array uh, can base it's financially it's like uh, prepaying for the electricity at half, at half price for the next 25 years. That's the long and the short of it. Um, the the roof on the building is an, an ideal roof as far as the structure for uh, for mounting an array. It's a standing seam roof, and where we can attach a solar array to that roof without uh, putting holes in it just clip on the ribs of the roof. So it's a uh, uh, real small chance of having problems with, uh, like a water leaks because of the system on the roof. What about wind? I'm just curious just because as we continue to go through climate change sure. with these big gusty winds, I'm just noticing as I walk mm. around in the woods that there are a lot more trees down and you know, we get those big sort of like bursts of wind. I just wonder how you guys make sure they're uh, like stay. <laughs> so, uh, the companies that where does it stop right to the root? Sorry, I because I, I don't know that much. Would it be because you know the ones that are up higher? Yeah. You know the wind could get under them, but are these will these be fairly? So you close need to some the... space on the back side of the panel to okay. to moderate uh, the temperature of the panel. And okay. you're right, there, is, there are lift, lift loads from wind. And the systems are, the, the systems, the racking systems, every company that has a racking system has design software to be able to, to design them for certain wind loads. <coughs> and uh, around here, most of them are designed at around 90 miles per hour. I think that's, the last project I did, it, I did it at 130 miles an hour just because we don't know what the, the environment's going to do. Right, right. And I just finished a book that scared scared me a lot. So yeah, and we could, you know, we could even, they're, they're installing these systems in places that have 180 mile an hour wind uh, ratings. And uh, the difference is uh, basically how many fasteners you use. So it's okay. not, it's so not, not difficult to, to do it. And uh, yeah, so it's all. Buckle man a little bit more than yeah, 90 miles an hour. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, because that thought's a terrifying one. Solar panels flying across the canyon. Well, well look at it's and, that part and you look and at the roof with it. <laughs> that was part of the their problem was all their solar panels. <laughs> yeah. It became sales and just just so Yeah, so it certainly has to be done right. It's not hard to do that, though. Excellent. Yeah. The more we can go this way, the better. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great move. And that one would cover the full electric cost of the, the school. So, so the design that I have and the, and the numbers that I have in front of you guys are uh, preliminary, and there are some things left out. Um, 
and some things assumed. So this should be enough information to give you a, a pretty pretty close ballpark to decide whether you guys are serious about it. And then we can, if you choose to, we can go forward. And I need to uh, I need to be in the school, uh, looking at uh, the structure of the school. I need to look at the electrical. Um, and I also need access to uh, the power bills uh, for the school so I can uh, basically hone the design. Um, so this is an, pr would produce enough electricity to fully cover our costs. Is there other money that we would regain by putting some of the uh, power back into the system or anything like that? Or So <coughs> this system um, is designed very close to covering it's actually designed to cover 115% uh, of your usage. So it's oversized based on usage. But you guys are paying, like most everybody at home is paying 16 cents a kilowatt hour. And the school, this school, we're paying 21 cents on average. And I, I haven't seen the, the rate. Well, I know what the, the, the label on the rate is, but I need to see the the electric bill to see how you guys are getting charged. So if you pay 21 cents here and we build a system, they're going to give us 18.9 cents for what we produce. So there's a, there's a gap there. But I think what's happening is you guys are getting charged for uh, peak usage. Mm -hmm. And if that, I don't know if that's the right term, but if that's accurate and we produce uh, solar power at the same time, I think we can save some of that. So it'll take some time for me to size it exactly as we need it. But the goal is, yeah, to, to eliminate the electric bill with the exception of the connection fee, which is 25 bucks a month or so. And then the excess um, that's produced, if there is, I think it goes into a pool that we can draw from if we have bad bad months or bad years? or so. You can you can keep so you get credit if say if you use ten and you make twelve you get two credit <coughs> and you can store that for up to twelve you can keep that for up to twelve months okay. for this location mm -hmm. if we so we can't apply it to other schools you can based on a percentage so if we say we build this out one hundred and fifty percent of this, the size that we need we can say okay we're going to keep. We're going to keep one, uh, two thirds of it here, and credit the other third to another school. But it's that's that's how Green Mountain Power allows us to do it. So there's there are some constraints there. You know, if, if our usage changes here, we're giving a third to another school, keeping two thirds. At the end of the day, it, it financially, it's uh, you can recoup all of the cost or all of the benefit from the system if you set it up right, basically. So what would be the downside? <clears throat> the downside? Uh, so the system would be there 25 years from now. Our children will need to decide what to do with it. Um, if there was a problem with the roof, which I wouldn't expect because the roof is looks like it's brand new, um, you would need to remove the panels to, to fix the roof. Oh, yeah. Was it, is it 12 years, the roof? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the metal roof should be for probably 50 to 100. 75, I thought. It's the lot. second roof on the building. <coughs> the first one had problems. Was it a metal roof? Yeah. It was? I believe so. Mm. There was a lot of problems in the building when it was first built. Yeah. Like, the first, there was, we almost lost it because of water infiltration in the back wall. Really? So basically, they didn't put the roof on. Probably. There was a lot of things going wrong there. You just finished it up when I first started on the school board, so we're still signing off on the last checks on the checklist. Yeah. So what happens if in ten years we don't have a, a student population to support a school in Braintree? No, we don't need a school in ten years in Braintree. From a solar point of view? Well, from a no, from our, <laughs> our, that's something <laughs> we need to discuss. View. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, from a solar, I, I can answer from a solar point of view. If that sit, sit, is sitting there vacant, 
it's still producing the electricity, it can be credited to another building in town. <clears throat> or conceivably, if the building were sold, it would, it would raise the value of the, the selling price. Definitely. Is, are, is the construction of the roof, the rafters, etc., have enough load-bearing capacity to support these? We need to uh, have a structural engineer take a look at it. So that's not, we don't know yet, obviously. It, I'm 95% sure it's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it adds up to less than three pounds per square foot, and the uh, buildings are designed for 50 pounds per square foot of snow. Mm -hmm. So it's a relatively small amount. So it's, I'm sure there's, I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a design factor in there that would allow it. But yeah, we would need to confirm that. Is there any, are there any other questions? Well, I take it you're going to find out a little bit more about the roof also before we set all these panels on it. Yeah. That, that it's going to, that you think it will last at least 25 years, is that sure. what we're looking at? Yeah. Well, they still produce after 25 years, it's just that how much they produce starts to decrease. No, no, time. I mean just the roof not needing to need need yeah, to be right. fixed or that would be, to be serious yeah. expense would it to replace the roof and have to take all the panels off and then replace the roof and put them back on yeah it would be. Right. so yeah. We, would, we would would not want to install it on a roof that's aging right rapidly at least right you want to have 25 years of life in the roof if you're okay. going to put panels on right yeah so that needs to be found out before we decide maybe. So details, yeah. those sorts of details are yeah. something that uh, there, there's going to need to be a little bit of money spent to, to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm hoping for is to get an idea of what you guys think about the finances of, of the system. How much would it cost for all? I'm part. sorry? What is the cost to install? It's a preliminary estimate is 194000 Did you see? Yeah. Oh, here. You've got all the money. And so in terms of financial, financial, there is enough. There's $2.2 in the facility surplus. You know, obviously, we're thinking about the Raven pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. um, the Raven piece is interesting because we've got those structural engineers checking out the, the Raven building in terms of what the foundation you know, work has to be done the foundation to deal with the new construction. So if we had an idea of what we're looking for, we could send them over one day just to do that. Since we're here tonight. Sure, I can I can provide them with the total weight of the system and the square foot. Uh, yep. weight of the system. And I'm, it's easy enough for me to, to get the the billing to you through Robin. Uh, the R3 group that's working in town um, also collected the, that information. They were kind of taking a look. And then the only other thing to be aware of is that under state law, we have to do a bid yeah. uh, with mm -hmm. three different folks, so just to keep that in people's minds. So we can't really make a decision right now because we we haven't mm -hmm. even yeah. um, called this meeting to order. Sure. And it's, so it's, you it's know, this is just an informational, yeah. you know, so we will have to add this to our agenda probably next month so that we can, you know, discuss it sure. uh, properly. I want to kind of to add on a little bit with the R3 group. They're looking um, to try to put a solar charging station for electric vehicles at one of the schools. Uh, they want to pay for about 95% of that. The um, question is what school, um, if the solar project was going in here, you know, we might be able to use a little bit of the money that they would swing our way for that charging station uh, to help cover the costs as well. Um, we also talked a little bit about the idea, and again, this is thinking way down the line, that this is successful, the possibility of, of the other schools. Um, high school I'm extremely interested in because it is the opportunity to build the tech center. Um, I talked with the folks over there, again, real preliminary, just kind of shooting the breeze about the fact that, you know, given today's day and age, um, it might be worthwhile to start taking a look at an automotive program that teaches the kids how to fix and maintain electric cars. Um, Dan is also taking a look at grants um, that are out and about for electric buses, um, which is uh, the other possibility, especially if you get the charging station. And the students can learn how to maintain the buses in the charging station. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of discussion around this right now, a lot of possibilities. Why did we choose to investigate Braintree School most 
you know. Uh, Adam uh, came forward with it, and I think it was mostly due to that differential um, in the kilowatt hour cost. Right? For whatever reason, we're paying 20% more per kilowatt hour at Braintree than at the other schools. Um, and there is a capacity limit um, that Adam can describe a little bit. You're only allowed to generate so much electricity. So like we, if we put the solar panels on the high school, we wouldn't be able to generate enough his, uh, under their regs enough um, electricity to cover all the costs. Braintree, we could. And then you get into a situation where, well, yeah, maybe we're not allowed to put in enough solar panels on the high school to cover all the costs, but if we have a little extra at each of the smaller schools, mm -hmm. uh, potentially to cover it. So, so um, the, 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 the first thing that we really need to do if you guys choose to go forward with this is to um, Apply for a pub, uh, sorry. Um, it's a net metering registration form, and it we need to know if Green Mountain Power can accept the power, and they're the only ones that can tell us that. And so that's something that, uh, with a system of this size, we can send in the paperwork for free, but most likely it'd be a thousand bucks or twelve hundred bucks or something for them to do a grid analysis to tell us whether the system, whether they can accept the power. And my expectation is they can, but I don't know for sure. And uh, I've run into a little bit of trouble in Randolph um, with other uh, jobs that I was working on where uh, they can't accept the power, even on a smaller scale. So that, that would be the first step, because it's possible that that could kill, kill the project. So in other words, their infrastructure just can't support it. Right. So there are places in Randolph where you can't do solar because there's already too much solar. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we want. I mean, that's where we want to start, and it's you know, it's uh, pretty cheap money to do that. But if you look at the look at the paperwork here, the cost of the system is 194,000. Um, the software that I use is uh, it will give me uh, the estimate of production in kilowatt hours within a couple of percent. Uh, so it's pretty accurate. The, f the financial estimate that I have here, uh, $430,000, there are a couple of things that are left out from that. One is um, the value, the cost of electricity is gonna go up over time, it always has, 3.5% or so a year. And so uh, the value of the electricity may go up or down over time. If it's locked in, you know, if we, if we, start, if we started today, today, we'd have 10 years with it locked in at a certain rate that we're going to get back. And after that 10 years, we don't know exactly what they're going to give us back. So there, this, is, this is assuming zero change in value in direct electricity and zero change in value in what they give us for our electricity. That, neither one of those is probably going to be accurate. So it's going to change. They don't lock in the rates when you do the solar? They do for 10 years. Yeah. But after that, change. The nice part about it is in 10 years, the system, if we spend 200 grand to build the system, in the 10 years where it's locked in, we'll get 200 grand worth of electricity out of that. And then after that, it's gravy, pretty much. Um, what sort of warranty is on these? So the components have, it depends on what we use for components. Uh, the inverters are, are the items that are most worth talking about. They generally have a warranty of 10 to 12 years. And it's a new enough industry that nobody really knows exactly who is going to last how long, you know, which inverter is going to last, last how long. Um, but uh, I estimated the maintenance costs uh, at uh, about 27000 on the system. That would give us 3% of the cost of the system plus the cost of all seven inverters replaced one time in the 25 years. 
And so the inverters are basically taking the direct current that's produced and turning them into alternating? Yep, exactly. Um, and typically, with the exception of cooling on that, it's magnets and wires. It should be pretty stable. They're pretty stout setups. Um, who knows if they'll actually last the 25 years, but you're guaranteed they'll last more than 10. <laughs> Panels are, uh, the modules are generally warranted for workmanship for uh, five years and production. They have a, a, a production degradation warranty, so at, so at uh, year 25, they're guaranteed to be producing 80% of their original rating um, and that's actually a, that's figured into the production estimate that, I, that I have, you guys have in front of you. I've always wondered about hail damage and things like that. Yeah so they're, they're the panels are uh, a stout system you can set them up on blocks and walk on them. Um, hail damage you know if we got baseball sized hail I think there's a risk there so we would certainly want want them to be insured. Uh, there is insurance for that. Okay, I just don't know enough about those forms of insurance. Too. Yeah, I think they would. Um, I've never seen a hailstorm here that I think would damage okay. uh, those, but I think it's it's a valid point, and I think we should make sure that if the system. That's a conversation with this. Oh, of course. Yeah. I just you know. <clears throat> All right. Anyone else have another question? Concern? Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. Appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, what do you want to do with less than? Are we positive the quorum is based on the original number and not the current number? That's a good question. Well, can we get sworn in and then we're... No, because no. we have to vote, to, we have to, vote to accept the oh. what's the, um, what's the What's the number right now? Six? Yeah, six. We've got four. Right. Um, so technically... That would be a quorum yeah. of the... Remaining board members. Remaining board members, yeah. Which right. makes sense. Um, besides the fact who's going to argue it. You can do it. Sort of I, 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 I hate to, I hate to say it this way, but hey, guys, um, you know, people aren't gonna. If, if there's no worry about people arguing it, then you know. You I would go ahead and do the appointment. And if it needs to be redone, it can always. Yeah. It's yeah, but then we have a, But then we have to re-vote all of our. We would have to. Votes. Yeah, we would have to redo everything. If, if we, we can do that. I mean, probably thirty. In a, you know. I don't think we have much for both sides. Mostly information. Let's call yes. this meeting to order at seven o'clock. Um, the first uh, goal of the meeting is to accept the recommendations of the Randolph Select Board to accept the nominations of Ashley Lincoln and Ann Kaplan as our new board members. Um, so moved. Second. All those in favor of accepting the recommendations of recommended nominations? Aye. 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 All right. Um, so okay. we'll have swearing, swearing in. <laughs> um, repeat after me. I and state your name. I Ann Kaplan. I Ashley Lincoln. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will be true and faithful. That I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont. To the state of Vermont. And that I will not. And that I will not. Directly or indirectly. Directly or indirectly. Do any act or thing. Do any act or thing. Injurious to the Constitution. Injurious to the Constitution. Or government thereof. Or government thereof. So help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury. So help me God or under the pains and penalties of perjury. Okay. And I, I, and state your name, Ann Kaplan, Ashley Lincoln, do solemnly swear or affirm, do solemnly swear or affirm, that I will faithfully execute the office, that I will faithfully execute the office, of Orange Southwest School District Director, of Orange Southwest School District Director, until the next election, until the next election, for the town of Randolph, for the town of Randolph, and will therein, and will therein do equal right and justice. Do equal right and justice to all persons, 
to all persons, to the best of my judgment, to the best of my judgment, and ability, and ability, according to law, according to law. So help me God. So help me God. Or under the pains and penalties of perjury. Or under the pains and penalties of perjury. Okay. I need you both to sign these, and you're all set. But what's interesting is the state of Vermont when they did the swearing in for being a teacher and teacher license. It was almost. Verbatim the swearing in that I did when I got in. Oh, yeah, what's it? Yeah. 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 So, signature mm -hmm. of Justice of the Peace. Of Justice Peace or local official. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. You're the local official. <laughs> <laughs> Important to know that. <laughs> it's a multi use form. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. If Thank you would like a copy, I will mail you a copy. That's okay. Thank you, Joyce. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you. All right. Mm. <coughs> so we've already had the presentation and discussion of the solar project. Um, next is the public comment. And I just wanted to invite our guests, um, if you had anything to say or bring up to the board at this time. Okay, you'll also notice that we have several uh, public comment uh, periods put into the uh, meeting agenda today. This is part of our response to previous concerns that public comment was limited to that first section of our meeting. So we're, we're trying it. We're experimenting with having a couple of public comment um, periods throughout the meeting. All right. Next, we have the budget update, <laughs> which is That's lanes. A, and there is a paper copy uh, to make sure that you have. Um, and then I'll give people a couple of caveats so we can discuss parts and pieces of it that you're interested in. I could be a general overview. Oops, sorry. Did you get this? Okay. So um, what we're, the stage that we're at right now uh, is we spent about a month um, as a cabinet. And the cabinet, um, depending upon the school, has spent some time talking with the faculties to kind of lay down on the table everything they feel is necessary to meet the board's ends, um, to deal with some of the issues um, that are causing problems in terms of academic ch achievement, primarily the, um, the trauma-based behaviors that are happening in the school, um, and to kind of reverse a little bit of uh, the level funding, um, non-salary level funding that's happened uh, over the course of time. Um, level funding is kind of like compound interest in reverse. Um, every year you lose a, bit, a little bit and then you lose a little bit on what you lost as well as what you're losing this year. Um, so over the course of time there was a lot of, uh, lot of cuts, um, a lot of things that were reduced um, and there's an interesting cycle that occurs um, when you start to cut programming, when you start to cut staff, your enrollment goes down. When your enrollment goes down you lose funding uh, when that happens, you end up having to cut more programs and more staff, and it becomes a vicious cycle um, that we're trying to break. Now, there is everything that we've talked about um, is in this report. Um, obviously, we do not expect to get, get all or most of it, um, but I think it's important uh, to give the community kind of an overview um, of the thought process and what the different schools are kind of concerned about in regards to their needs. Um, in general, um, in terms of addressing uh, the trauma-based behaviors, uh, there are two pieces uh, that go into this. Um, and the first is public preschool. So public preschool means that the district is paying uh, for the teachers. Uh, people that take care or bring their kids to the preschool are not paying a fee to do so. Um, we are looking at public preschool full day um, at all three elementary schools. Um, there is enough capacity if we do that. Each of those preschool units can handle about 20 kids. There's enough capacity there if we did this that all four-year-old students would have a spot. All of them. All. Oh, that's excellent. Three-year-old students, if there are spaces, um, you know, could go through a lottery system to fill in those spots. But the problem with three-year-olds is that a full day is probably a little bit too much. So in addition to this, we would be keeping the morning and afternoon preschool at Randolph uh, Elementary to serve those three-year-olds. Um, there still would be a waiting list uh, for the three-year-olds um, that are on there. 
So that's kind of what we're looking at. What it would require, it would require one preschool teacher and one support staff at each school. That's by state rights. Um, and one of the reasons that we're really focused on this, again, it's this idea of the, the, the trauma-based behaviors. Um, if the students are experiencing adversity in, in the home and in their home environment, um, that's where these behaviors come from. If we don't address them until later on down the line, those behaviors can become so ingrained, it's very hard to break them. If we start early, if we start our interventions early, um, we get the kids in here, um, we give them a little respite from what's happening in the home, um, they get connected with the teachers here, they're able to build some trust, um, and we can do some social work with them to give them some skills to be more resilient um, and to change the behaviors that are manifesting themselves within the school. So that's kind of the, the, the goal of the preschool. Besides the fact um, that our poverty population um, across the three towns runs about 38% um, in terms of the, the people that are coming to school based on free and reduced lunch, um, there's a lot of folks there that couldn't afford um, preschool for their students um, in the state of things right now if they needed it. So are you, what's your full day? A school day or are you saying extended hours? Full day. Full, full school, full school day. day. Until like 5 o'clock? So for example... Uh, no, until 2.30, till but okay. then um, after school programs yes, which have been self-sufficient, mm -hmm. um, if we can build them, um, they actually bring in enough revenue that they cover their own costs. So for example, kindergarten students, they can go for that full till 2 o'clock and then they have after school up until what is it, 5 or 5.30, I forget yep. which. And so would that be the full day that you're... To get to, to get to 5.30, yes. Yeah, so so for, the full, for full day preschool is, is the right. 8 o'clock to 2.30. Gotcha. And then uh, after school pro programming beyond that. Okay. So and that, the after school then would be parent paid. Paid, yeah. yeah and that, um, like I said, the, the after school program that we have now does generate enough revenue to pretty much cover all its costs, which is kind of nice. Um, the other reason for the full day preschool is that, you know, the research is really clear, um, extended time on learning is what allows kids to grow and advance, um, and extended time on learning with a qualified teacher um, does the trick. And so I think if these kids spending a significant amount of time in the preschool program, they should be in a very good spot um, to be able to um, take advantage of the education that comes later on down the line. And the research is pretty clear on that. Too. A couple questions. Sure. Um, so currently, the kindergarten program is full day at all three of our schools. Mm -hmm. Kindergarten. The kindergarten is mm -hmm. so because I know when I my kids came here, it was not. So that's changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and there's room in all three schools to satisfy the need. Yep. Here. Now we are we are at a point. We'll talk about that later tonight. We get to the enrollment numbers. The enrollments are going up. Enrollments are going up, and that's one of the reasons that you see a lot of a lot of the ads to staff um, that are in here is to kind of deal with that. But even with that increasing enrollment, there would still be capacity, mm -hmm. yeah. and this includes um, lunch mm -hmm. for them as well, and they can ride the bus in the morning and the afternoon. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So I know in the past, people who so say a staff person comes in and they have a child that's preschool they age. Take a priority. They can they can enroll their kids in the program. Yeah. Okay. And that that's a, a, a part of trying to attract um, the best staff. Quality yeah. staff. Yeah. Uh, what about infrastructure? I know at Ringtree you've got the full day this year. Yeah. And you had to do renovation of the playground in order to make it pre-K safe. Yeah. What so, about uh, Randolph Elementary in Brookfield? You so ran so the, those costs are, are in there. Um, Randolph Elementary is set to go because it already has the preschool. Um, they may have to do some work within a room. I mean, there's there's um, specifications for the bathrooms, things like that. Um, it'll be about five thousand um, to convert things up at Brookfield um, to get it up. So it's not a significant yeah. amount. And what, what's interesting is um, the the brain tree program is is full. There's about eighteen kids in there. The last right. time I walked through, a lot of them are Brookfield kids too. Right. So there's a, yeah. And all Randolph kids are. Yeah, when they were competing to get into that program. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's expensive. Um, I was talking with Rob, I think it's about 300000 to do it. And we're, talking, we're, we're talking large amounts of money for some of these things, um, but the idea is it's long-term investment. Um, what happens to these students now um, with the trauma-based behaviors and that population has been growing is they come into the elementary schools uh, because uh, the behaviors, and we're not talking minor behaviors, 
Um, we're talking, um, you know, freezing, flying. You know, um, they they'll run out of the school. They'll have a, a meltdown that stops um, the class for a significant amount of time each day. I mean, they're significant behaviors. What they do with them now is they throw a pair on. You know, in the old days, you try to get rid of pairs um, because they were helping students with academics. Now it's not academics that's a problem, it's the behaviors. And so they put a para with them. Now there's a problem with that. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and the paras do a really good job uh, with the students during the day. But at the end of the day, the students have no more skill than they had at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And more importantly than that, what they're finding is that um, instead of learning how to self-regulate themselves, they have an outside person doing it for them as adults. Um, and the students over the course of time can actually become dependent on the adult um, to regulate their behaviors for them. And so what you see, and you kind of, there's a reflection of it here, is the students have the paras in the elementary schools and they stay in the schools and they advance through the curriculum um, fairly well. Uh, but when they get to the middle high school, there's a problem. Um, they do not have the capacity to deal with behaviors of that magnitude. They don't have the paras there. And so those students, um, by and large, they'll end up getting sent to outplacements. Outplacements per student are 30,000 to 150,000 a student. And that doesn't include another probably 20 to 40,000 in transportation costs, um, which is one of the reasons that our, our special education budget has been growing by leaps and bounds as we're getting more and more of those students can't be handled here, they get sent out. And the goal of the preschool along with the therapeutic program that we'll talk about in a little bit is to remediate those problems so the students are able to regulate themselves, they, they know how to deal with their own stresses, um, and they don't need the supports eventually. Um, and so that we don't have to worry about those costs. Um, to put things in perspective, we do have one student right now um, that's 279,000 a year for the services. That for the one student? Mm -hmm. But that's probably not a student we're going to be able to accommodate anyway. Uh, no. Um, we had two students that moved in last year. If you remember, that was the reason for the big budget jump was about 300000 mm -hmm. Again, those are students that if those uh, interventions, those remediations happen early on. Yeah, but I mean, we're right. still going to have people moving in who haven't... Ha you know, benefit, we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're still going to have those. Yep. So I, I think we can't say that that necessarily reduces all those costs. Yeah. Uh, it won't reduce all, but it, it should more than pay for itself after a few years uh, is, is the goal. Given that the students stay in the system. Yeah. And we'll, we'll take a look at the, the enrollment numbers when we get there. I'll show you, you know, how things are going in special education. And the fact that we've got another population of students um, that we may have to put in programming to deal with in our office because our autism population has tripled in the last five years. Students with autism. Um, so other things to kind of consider. Now the other, other main piece and probably another most expensive piece in here um, is the idea of building a therapeutic program. Um, how a therapeutic program for the elementary students work uh, is you have a licensed social worker in there, you have a content teacher, it's in the classroom. Um, the kids are not constrained to that classroom all the time. Um, it's a place uh, when their behaviors start to manifest themselves that they can go, they can be brief, um, they can get what they call co-regulated, get them calmed down, get them to a point where they're rational. Um, they can work on a couple of strategies uh, with, the, with the teachers that are in there, and then they go back out to the regular classroom environment and practice what they learned. Um, if things get bad, if things fall apart again, they know they've got a safe place they can retreat to and go through the process again so that they can acquire the skills over time. Um, that program um, would happen here at Randolph Elementary. It's too expensive to do at all three schools. Um, but what we would do um, is look across the district at the students um, that qualify for it. And any of the students that qualify for it would be able to attend that program if the parents are willing to have their students attend Randolph Elementary um, to partake of it. Um, there is a model program in Milton, Vermont, uh, that the elementary teachers are going to go visit. This is modeled after, and it's been in place for a few years with some very good results. Um, and again, the idea is to give those students the skills, right? We talk about adaptability in the ends, um, so that they don't need those support services down the line. Um, we have a financial savings because of that. And more importantly, the skills that we give them are lifelong. It's not just meant to get them through school. It's meant so that after they leave here, 
you know, they've got something permanent that they take in. Take in. Uh, so those are the, the two two biggies on there. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that physically. Um, so can I just interrupt yep. for a second? So is this this push for this? Has this come from the teachers? Where is it coming from? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of the climate um, survey piece. Uh, there's a push for it from the teachers. Um, there's a recognition that we cannot continue to maintain, you know, 10 and 15 percent leaps in the special education cost each year um, because we're not able to remediate the issue. Um, so if we're not able to remediate it, every time a kid comes in, you know, it's uh, the rest of their education paying money to to take care of them, um, and then at the do you end, have no do you return. have that data? Do you have like yeah, where it shows? Yeah, you'll see you'll see a lot of it the, tonight. The increases in costs. Okay, yeah. so one of my that kind of goes in with one of my. I have two questions on this topic. Yeah. One is: Is there evidence that this works? I mean, this it's a big investment for future return. Yeah. But but I'd like to see that it is a good investment. Yeah. There's um, there's a there's a data, lot. I mean, it sounds like a great idea. Yeah. But. There's model programs are all a little bit different. Um, this one really ties in really well uh, with the work of David Melnick, um, who has been coming in the last couple of years, um, even prior to, to my start, um, working with the, the faculty to try to teach them how to kind of co-regulate the kids in the classroom. And you can do that for some of the students that are kind of at the moderate level, uh, but the real severe ones, you just can't. Um, and so the goal is, like I said, it's, it's to remediate, it's to give them the skills so that you don't have to provide the services for the rest of your time here. Then um, I guess my other question is, if you take, the, if you take all of the students who have a disrupted traumatic background and you put them all in the Randolph School, what does that do to the general classes in the Randolph School? Um, and and if, you, if you were a parent in the Randolph School, would that be? Yeah. Again, it's a better situation than they have now. Now, when the kid melts down in the classroom, what happens? Everybody's disrupted. Everybody's disrupted, learning stops. Um, the kid will then, or in a lot of cases, will come out of the class, they're losing learning, they're with a person who does not have the skill to properly um, you know, work with that student. Um, because a lot of the work isn't intuitive. Um, we tend, as educators, and as parents, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. We deal with the behavior side of things. Um, the what you're seeing in terms of behavior isn't really a behavioral issue. It's a stress response, right? They've got they've been under been traumatized. They've got some post-traumatic stress disorder. So the goal of this is to deal with the root of the problem. The root of the problem is how the body reacts when it's under stress or it senses it's in danger. These students are hypersensitive to everything happening in the environment around them, and if anything happens that reminds them or clicks the, the needle over to say, hey, I'm in danger based on past experience, um, the very first thing that happens is there's a physiological change, right? The breathing rate goes higher, the stress level goes up. The goal of these programs is to deal with that piece. Don't deal with the behavior. We deal with teaching them how to calm down that nervous system so that they can remain rational and calm. Um, and then kind of take a look at what's really going on in their envir environment, um, see it for what it really is, um, and be able to respond to it appropriately. So it's, uh, again, it's a specialized. Um, you know, anytime we're, you know, I get, get a little worried uh, with the schools, anytime we're putting students out, you know, for detentions or suspensions, if it's, the behavior is happening because it's a stress response, it's not really fair to the kid and it can make things worse. Um, and because we've got so much of it, you know, I wonder if we've added to the problems um, in some cases. So. so are you proposing five new hires for that program? Again, this is the or, are these this is this is what they've laid out. Um, I'm trying not to put my opinion in there. I want the, the cabinet to figure it out. Uh, but, but we as a board we need to have your opinion yeah, of we, really we what's essential. So the, but here. Dece December because uh, January is the final vote. December, you'll have my opinions on all the changes. December. So our next meeting, yeah. when you so, come back. So they've got everything budget. on the table. I'm meeting with them weekly, um, starting Thursday. The next time that we meet as a cabinet, um, what's going to happen is we're going to start reading this back, and we'll talk about this. Do for this particular one, this program, do I think you need five staff now? 
Um, I think you need the licensed social worker. I think you need the teacher. And we already have the parents here. If some of the students are coming into the classroom, to, into this program that already have parents, why would we need to hire more? Um, so, you know, I, th I think it's, it looks more like two people than five. Okay. Yeah. So again, that's why I called it the fantasy, fantasy one. Um, it's laying out, ideally, five would be awesome. Especially given the number of, of students that we're dealing with. Well, I mean, we've just, just last year even, you know, you talked about decreasing staff yeah. because, you know, the we had too Acad many. Academic. Right, you know, and, you know, we still are an academic institution. Yeah. Yes, definitely we have to deal with, you know, behaviors, but I, I, you know, I think we really need to be realistic about both what our communities can, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, support and sort of, you know, our goal and mission, you know, is not to be overstaffed here. You yeah. know, I really think we need to yeah. know Especially what when you started strategically about, yeah. you wanted to have the curriculum development assistant principal or whatever yeah. you called them, but you wanted one at high school and then at elementary level. That's two huge full time positions. Those aren't going to be cheap. Big administrative there, there are, there, positions. There are, right. Those ones are already there from last year. Um, it would be nice to have a curriculum coordinator. Not going to happen. It's not even on the list. Um, there yeah, are looking. ways I can work within the structure that we have, and it's already already happened. You know, so, so. all right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll hear the rest of the fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, but, I, but again. You know, I'd appreciate sort of your, your saying, well, you know, because this does look a little pie in the sky. Oh, yeah. But again, remember, these are the honest opinions of your leadership team. Um, and you do, I do want to throw out there again, this is what happens with the level fund. Had some of the programs, um, because you're going to see in the data, the, these uh, behavioral issues with the students, the trauma-based students, um, started to increase years ago, and had they been a program put in place to remediate it at that time, um, po possibly, most likely, you know, we wouldn't be in the boat that we're in right now. But um, you can't guarantee anything with social engineering. You can be pretty, pretty, pretty assured, but you know, it's it's still a probability. It's a high probability this will work, but nothing's guaranteed. Uh, so, um, depending on whether you have the right people in there too. Yeah. The other um, area outside of all the other parts and pieces here, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the money um, is due to trying to move people out of title and into the regular budget. Yeah. My honest opinion, that's not going to happen. Um, that's a significant chunk. Um, one of the reasons, however, that it's a major concern is those people are vital um, mm -hmm. to, to the operation of the district. And as of last year, when the federal and state governments revamp the title program and title process, we don't get the money until mid-November. So we lose two, two and a half months of time with these interventionists um, and, and with the coaches, um, which is a significant impact. On so we don't schools. hire the person until November? Or we just they, they lose the money up front? Yeah, uh, typically what's done is um, they have a, a time, uh, I think it was around October 15th this year, when we'll say you're substantively approved. Now, what that means is you're not guaranteed to get the money, but you're fairly guaranteed to get it, and at that point in time, you can start paying people. Um, but again, it might come out that they don't approve it, and you, you've, you've paid the money, you've got the person on staff, and you can't pull it back. Um, traditionally, that's what's been done um, prior to my coming. Um, but again, the process has changed. The regulations have changed. Um, have made it a lot more stringent, a lot more difficult. So probably what's going to begin happening um, is at the end of every year, those folks that are on title get rift, and they do not get hired back until we have the money in the bank. Um, so we're looking at the November time frame, if things stay the way that they've done the last two years. And so then where would we put the title fund if, we, if we're paying these people out of budget? Where would we put the title fund? We wouldn't be paying them out of budget. We'd just be waiting for the, the Oh, if, if we moved them over to, to regular, like I said, that's not possible. Then what we can do with the title funding um, is we can begin to really focus on the programming that's missing. So we would science hire. program for the elementary school. Um, we could probably use it like, you know, one of the plans for next year um, is up at uh, Brookfield is for a year. We can probably get most of that preschool program so there's lots of but things. then we're still doing the same thing. Right. But it gives you know, us it gives us a start up for the year, uh, and then we could transfer 
but we're okay. But yeah. we're still paying for it and right. waiting to be approved in November. Well, so we I, I don't we, see that we're addressing we, the problem yeah, at all. We can't. We can't really even pay for it because it will be considered supplanting. So if we pay for it, then they'll come back and say we're not approving you for it because. So th so then I'm I still asking. So how yeah. would we use the title funds then? So programming. The other piece, um, and it goes along with the same idea of the paraprofessionals that we've talked about, um, interventionists that we've had here for years, they're not supposed to be in existence in a district for more than three years. When you bring one on board, they're supposed to be an exit strategy. Why? Because the interventionists basically are filling in gaps in knowledge, whereas if your curriculum is up to speed, those gaps wouldn't exist in the first place. So they're meant to be in there for a short amount of time, um, just long enough to fill in the gaps while the curriculum gets up to speed and does it for them. The other issue is that um, you get the same sort of problem. You don't want the kids becoming dependent upon those adults to get the work done and be able to access the curriculum, which can happen. Um, it's likely that uh, because we've had those uh, folks for so many years, it's likely we may not be able to get them again. They keep saying it, they, they haven't done it, but they keep saying that that's what's going to happen. That's what they said last year. And are they only here in this school? Nope, they're, they're, across, they're across the district. In yeah. the high school each, as well. Each school, yep. Um, and then the, the number that's there depends upon the population in the school. So when we write those, uh, the title grants, so they give us a block um, sum of money every year that we always get. Mm -hmm. um, what we have to do is we have to go in and do this extensive application process um, and spell out what we're using it for, why we're using it, um, what purpose it's going to serve, and whether and how it plays into our continuous improvement plan. Um, so we have to do that for each person and every bit of, bit of money that we ask for. So there's usually about 35 of those by the, by the end, end of the time for each processes we have to go through And that interventionist is dealing with behavioral issues? Uh, it depends on what the interventionist is. There are behavioral interventionists. Um, there are one or two um, within the district. Uh, most are academic. Again, there are, there are issues with curriculum. There are gaps in knowledge that the, the kids get because the curriculum is not up to speed. Um, and so what these academic interventionists do, there's usually a math and an ELA one at, at each of the schools, and they fill in those gaps. But the interventionists work directly with kids. Um, there's also coaches in there. Those are more along the lines that they work with. Uh, they work with the adults. They work with the teachers to help them improve their practice. Um, those uh, one and a half of them we moved over to the regular budget last year because they're vital uh, to get the curriculum work done. That's part of the structure I was trying to build um, to take the place of a, a curriculum director. So what happens if they say uh, no money for the interven inter interventionists this, we don't this have, year? We don't have interventionists. Uh, they've and already. Then what, then what do you do? Uh, we muddle through with what we've got somehow. Um, would, what? would not be easy. So right now you, you're saying that there's a shortcoming in the curriculum that's causing the in, in individuals to need the interventionists. And so how long do you think it's going to take to address the shortcomings in the curriculum so we won't be reliant on interventions? Yeah. So at the elementary level, um, especially uh, with the work that we did last year and the wonderful work that the, um, the curriculum coaches did, um, you know, you know, Crystal and Christine and Catherine, um, and they have their curriculum up to speed. Um, they spent last year doing the data analysis, finding out where the holes were. This year is implementation, so you should keep our fingers crossed. Um, see a small jump this year in terms of the elementary um, testing and academic performance, and that should grow um, as each year goes by. At the high school level, um, have not been able to do any significant work over there because of the excuse my expression of the GD um, graduation proficiencies and uh, the, the standards-based report cards. That has taken all of their time for the most part for the last three years. Um, they have been told um, that they've got to they've got to get stuff wrapped up in January, and then if you need to do work beyond that, you need to get a subcommittee in there because we've got to do the curriculum work at the high school. Um, there have been some discussions with the departments um, 
to try to give them a feel for what's happening. There were a couple of emails that kind of spent, spelled out the vision and, and what needed to happen because I don't get a lot of time to interact with the faculty in meetings, which upsets some people, um, but not necessarily in a bad way. Uh, to use some of their expressions, because um, we, we talked about the academic performance and why it was where it was um, in, in some of the meetings that I had at the department level with the staff. Um, the comment kept coming over and over again from high school folks, it's never been a priority. We haven't done it because it's never been a priority, which is, which is sad. So, uh, obviously, it's been a priority since you, you got here. You, you, yep. you're, you've been making a priority, which is, we're on board with that. And so, if January mm -hmm. would say, pie in the sky, the, it, everything's met. And so, January, they can start working on it. They can start doing yep. sub subcommittee work and such. How long would it take for them to get to a point to where the curriculum is... So you're gonna you're gonna see there there are really three things that you got to do um, to have uh, proper delivery to students um, to get them to advance and you're gonna see some of that in the budget please like the high schools asking for thirty thousand for summer work that's so they can develop the curriculum over the summer and get some professional development um, in terms of you know the math department was great talking about getting some professional development in how to structure a professional learning community so that they knew how to discuss data and results and go back and apply it to what's happening in the classroom. So the first thing that you got to have is you got to have the curriculum. The second thing that you need are tools to go and to assess um, how the students are performing on what you're teaching so that you can adjust your instruction to the weak areas. Um, and then the third piece is, is coaching just to improve the delivery. So yeah, we got the other pieces down. And that's, that's the tiering. You've got the foundation, the little piece, and then the peak. Uh, the deliveries at the peak. So if we were to fund the interventionists, would you say two years? If Are we talking that we're going to need interventionists for two years, three years? Probably two years. So at the end of those two years, we'd be able to cut those out of the budget yep. because they're, they're no longer needed. You, right? you won't be able to cut all of them. You will be able to cut most of them. No, regardless of how good um, the first year of instruction is, um, there will always be students that have gaps. But it won't be because of the curriculum. It'll be because of um, things in terms of that student's environment. Wasn't able to attend school regularly. Um, right. That's usually the big one. But if we gave you all the fiscal re fiscal uh, stuff that you, you're asking for right now to fix all the issues that, that um, the principals and you have said that are the shortcomings right now for academics, if we were to give you that today, if we said, yep, pie and sky within, within, within two to three years, this, this place would be a powerhouse. All right, and then in those two to three years, would the budget still need to remain at where it is, or would you be able to cut back back to a more yeah. a reasonable, so you're saying a $3 million increase is what this would uh, equate to. And, I, so and, would it, and again, we haven't asked my opinion. There's, there's probably 50% of that we could. All right, right. so, so, one point five, five million. million? 1. 8 yeah. million. Yeah, so of that one point five million, how much of that would be a? So that would become the flat increase every year, and what would it be able to eliminate so that? Probably, probably half of it. But we had talked early on about that cycle. Right. If you build it and it's good, our enrollment will keep going up. Right. If the enrollment goes up, that's more money that comes in at sixteen thousand per pop. Um, we built a revenue stream of over 300000 this year from the kids that are coming in by school choice. Um, the, for the work that was done, you know, soliciting the kids from, from Chelsea and Rochester. Mm -hmm. um, Granville um, is another opportunity. They are completely school choice. We have a bus um, that goes out there almost to the town line. Um, and so we're trying to solicit the elementary students to come here now that we're getting programs built. Just but trying to think it through because when we tell the public, I mean, this is only three million for, for, for this stuff, but we're not even talking about uh, salary increase, which right. is we're in no, contract that's, negotiating. That's, that's in, you the are. salary increases in there, and that's, the, so as well as the eleven percent for the um, health health increase. So you factored in what you what you believe we will settle a at number. for for a number, yeah. and, and, and that's all. That, that three million is everything. Everything. Can, so can I yeah. Well, Again, it's pie in the sky. Sure. We're not. We're just using it to have a discussion. We're not expecting. Yeah, but this is not our budget. This is his budget. Right. Are, are we still doing policy governance? We are. <laughs> yeah. so, but we are. but in, in the end, you have to vote on it to approve exactly. it. Exactly. So you may as well have, likely, you may as well have the that. input in it now, yeah. so I don't build something that you turn down three times. Right. So we right. miss our, our well, dates. But, 
If we, right. our, our policy is for you to, if you're going to make a case that you need to, we have to look at his rationale, mm -hmm. his interpretation. If he's saying, this is what I need, this is mm -hmm. my rationale, if he's following our policies, mm -hmm. He goes to the public, and I don't want to be responsible for going to the public and making the case for this budget. That's his job, not my mm -hmm. job. His job is to make a case that this is going to this is going to create the outcomes. We're looking at: Are you going to produce for our mm -hmm. district, for our taxpayers? Mm -hmm. But we also have to hold him accountable. Right. And so what right. we're trying so to do is the, the aggressive discussion will be December. Right, and so right. I, I guess so we're <laughs> now I'm. I mean, this is great. I mean, I don't. It uh, seems like I, I I appreciate hearing all the different ideas that you have, but this is the case he's going to have to make to the people, mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that we've got things in line and in place so that we can hold his feet to the fire. And say, okay, we gave it to you. What is, what outcomes mm -hmm. do we have here, and can we measure them, and how are we measuring them? Not, I mean, I don't want to go into the. He's the professional who can tell me what he needs. I'm 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 a lay person. He's got he's got to go out there, work with his administrators, work with his teachers, and say, this is what we need, and and we really think we need this increase. And it'll be really to the taxpayers to decide if they want to and give that's the that. Issue is, I don't know that they would three well, four million dollars. Well, let's increase let's let's is not talk let's talk approved. about that for a little bit. So remember how education funding is done. And I've been having weekly open forums to start to talk with the community about this, which have been really good. It's monthly, right? Uh, no, I've been doing it weekly with no. the budget coming. Are you getting more than just the parents in the school district? Because it's. People on fixed incomes are going to need to hear your rationale for yep. why you're going to ratchet up property taxes. But, but let's hold on. I, I don't Parents will be more than willing, probably, because they're the customers. Mm -hmm. But you've got a whole community that needs to hear this. And then we as a board need to see outcomes. All right, you show us. And we need to have data. It yep. needs to be uncomplicated where we say, boom, boom, boom. This is... This is what we've produced because you gave us that additional in amount of money to work with. And that's hopefully where we'll go with this. But So we, re we re you weren't here, unfortunately, but we revamped um, the ENDS mm -hmm. um, and, and okay. put some very specific data on there. So I can send you guys a copy of that and what we're looking, what we're looking at. I reinterpreted them. Um, the other piece I want to be careful of is how we talk about you know, how budgets are funded in Vermont. Um, if we increase our budget, it's not the local taxpayer that pays for it. Right. It's every right. taxpayer in the state. So there Up is to a certain amount. There, to a certain amount, there is a threshold, and I want to talk a little bit about that threshold. As far as the district is concerned, um, the the past superintendent did a really good job of meeting the civic responsibility of keeping below. Below. Mm -hmm. um, so we've done our part. Uh, but we're at a point in time where there needs to be an increase to, to allow us to survive and break some of the cycles that we're in. Right now, um, the threshold is determined by cost per student. Um, right now, we're at 15.3. State average is 15.6. The threshold is about 17.3. My intent is to push this budget as far as I can go without crossing that threshold. The 17.3? Yeah. Okay. And what's nice about that is, remember, if our enrollments keep going up, it's more and more and more that we're going to receive from the state. Um, so the other piece that's going along with this is there's been a dramatic push on the principals to really get out there and get out and about and try to get the enrollments up. We're trying to get that positive cycle going. Um, work for a year. We'll see if it continues into next year. Um, but if we build a powerhouse of a district, people will be moving here to take advantage of the schools. If you have full day free kindergarten, uh, preschool, people will move here to take advantage of the schools. If we have a therapy... Yeah, but we don't get money for those kids, so we don't... Uh, we or do. Or 0.4 or something. We do. For, for, and it's, it's, it, but it doesn't, it it doesn't cover the cost but of educating them. If the, 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 the goal is hopefully if they move here for the preschool, they stay through. Mm. And then you get the full that is, ADM. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 
Um, doesn't mean they will. There, there will be some, obviously, that right. can move in and out. So there, there has been a lot of thought um, that is, has, has gone into the parts and pieces. But before we move on, I do want to touch on one, one really important thing, and that's Brookfield. Um, Brookfield, at least in, in terms, of, uh, terms of what it needs, is, is very important. Um, they're up a little bit in, enroll in enrollment. They're going to be up a lot next year. Um, they needed a full-time teacher this year, so they've got to get a, a grade, grade teacher. We asked them, too, because math has been kind of a priority. We said, okay, do you want a math specialist who takes the kids out and teaches all the kids math, or would you have, rather have a, a, a grade teacher? They wanted a grade teacher, so that's what we focused on. Um, the other piece that goes along with... Uh, Brookfield that we just started talking about, um, and it actually is built into the numbers at the end, um, it doesn't show up in this listing, is we're at a point with the increase in enrollment that we've got to have a dedicated principal at each school. It's just not working. Um, when you lose that administrator from Brookfield for most of the day and the kids are acting up, um, not having that person there, it's a safety problem. The other folks that are there are, are not licensed and not equipped. Mm -hmm. um, to deal with those issues. Um, so I understand it from a, a budget piece, and I really understand it. The really powerful part of having those co-principals that was put together was the fact that it provides equity to the schools because they're mm -hmm. constantly talking and trying to keep things the same. Um, that can still continue, um, but if the enrollment keeps growing, we need dedicated principals. So it may mean bringing in another body here um, at Randolph Elementary to support that. Um, assistant principal, assistant principals at elementary schools are not expensive. Um, high school administrators are typically much more expensive than, than elementary. Um, so you would keep uh, David Roller at, at Brookfield and yeah. bring in someone new here? Yeah, and I actually, that discussion just started. I, we uh, sat down, I sat down with the three principals on Friday. I said, you got to do something now. Um, it's, it's likely that what they're going to decide is that David's going to be up there full time. Um, for the remainder of the year, um, because there's, there's a lot of things um, that, that that school needs that I think have been overlooked over the course of time. And what are and what have our enrollment numbers settled down at? Those are gonna those are coming up this oh, okay. later in the presentation. Very good. So okay. I'd actually like to backpedal a little bit sure. and go back to the high school. Um, perhaps I misunderstood one of your statements, and I'm hopeful that I did. Um, we're Right now, there is not the focus on the academics in the high school that you would like to see because there is too much focus on modifying the grading system? There hasn't been as much focus on the academics. In other words, because the teacher said that when you do the climate survey, that was one of the big things in, in terms of the morale piece is that we're doing all this extra stuff, but we're not able to get down to the nitty gritty of actually spending time with kids, evaluating how they're doing, and changing our instruction to match. So was that a directive, and I apologize, of this board, of your office, to make those modifications, or was that a statewide directive? S statewide directive happened before I came. Um, so they are attempting to the best of their ability to, to kind of fix it. Um, when I came in last year, because I started last year, um, I did point out to, to David and Elijah, I pointed out that there was a loophole in the law. Um, instead of going through all these detailed plans, um, what they could have done is just said in terms of their graduation proficiencies, you know, our students have met our required graduation proficiency in mathematics um, if they all take Algebra two and pass it with a B minus. I mean, they could have done it that way. Um, I understand the logic, and I asked him at the time, I said, are you invested in this uh, because you truly believe in it or just because that's how you interpreted the law and what you're putting in place? And at the time, they said they're invested in it because that's what they truly believe, uh, that it's going to be better for the kids. But the thing that I keep bringing up at the meeting, because my job is to make people reflect. I'm trying not to micromanage them. Um, but I am trying to make them think about stuff is the, the, the comment that I always make to them. I said, okay, you've been working on this for three years now. Mm -hmm. What has been the impact on learning in your school? And the response is none. That's a problem to me. Mm -hmm. Me too. They are, they, are getting close to the, uh, they are getting close to the end. Like I said, um, you know, there's, still, there's always going to be work on that. Um, but come January, they're switching over to start really focusing on the curriculum. We also have two courses to build to, to meet the ends. We've got the, uh, we've got the technology piece. Um, yeah, 
and my mind's life my skills mind's and the life skills. Yeah, so that work has already begun. Those are pieces that were part of the the mission, mm -hmm. um, your core values, your ends that have never really been addressed. Um, so we're trying to get that built into place. So that work will, will start up in January as well. So you guys handed me quite a bit mm -hmm. to focus on. And I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to do it. I don't want you to, to misthink that. But the, the magnitude um, of what needs to be done is absolutely huge. Um, and I'm pretty good. I've got a pretty good track record of getting it done. But I always underestimate how long it takes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my, my weakness. So I'm fully willing to um, support whatever it is that you say is what we need. I guess for me, though, to, to process it and yeah. to make it, in my mind, seem like, okay, it can justify the, the mm -hmm. amount because it seems like it's probably going to be a significant amount. I think I'd like to know, based on the projection, what would be the increase on or decrease uh, of student to staff ratio, student to teacher ratio, because the state is making a huge push on that. And 14. the governor being reelected, it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. So we got to make sure we're staying close to what he wants. And then with the increase, like what is the actual increase amount? And of that, what percentage of that do you think would stick around after, say, two to three years, four years, when you think the problems are are gone so i think off, i don't i mean like yeah, right off, now, off but, the cuff yeah. I, I would say you'd be able to get rid of half uh possibly three quarters but i'd have to really take a look at yeah, it yeah gotcha to be able to pull to pull the piece up the other reality is um is there are resources that we could tap into here yeah. um, i've been staying away from that for for morale issues but there are significant resources we could tap into morale is um, very important though yeah and, and so that's wanna... that's 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 the balance piece so i'm, I'm mm. leaving it alone yeah um, and, and not, not really talking about it um, we're having some discussions um, in some of the departments though in terms of getting people to reflect mm -hmm. um, and kind of come to those conclusions themselves um, but one of the issues is going to be if if there is a vote that you know you got to get an average ratio of, of 14 to 1 in terms of student to staff mm. that's going to have a huge impact on high school mm -hmm. if it's legislated mm -hmm. leave it, I'll leave it at that um, summary wise there's a little summary there that I wrote up mm -hmm. um, one of the things to be aware of again we, we talk about the special education students and the, the growth in that population um, so you got to be careful with the special education numbers because there's still reimbursement. Mm -hmm. The problem with um, special education, though, is you don't get reimbursed until after you spent it. Mm -hmm. So even though you're going to get reimbursed for a significant portion of it, you got to have it up front. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and again, this is some of some of this is real. Probably 11, 12 percent of this is real. Um, in terms of having to increase the special education budget um, to add the pieces that they would really like um, to really make the program do what it's supposed to, they're looking at a 19 percent increase. So go back to the real number. This is just the special education line. Um, we're looking at an 11 percent increase, um, which is less than the 14 percent last year. Um, and of that, probably three, four percent of it um, is going to be reimbursed. Or is reimbursed. Three or four percent percent would be reimbursed. Okay. So it gets it down to you know around seven percent, eight percent. But again, you know, if you want to look at the magnitude um, of the problem in terms of the trauma-based behavior, right? We're at 2.8 million of a 16 million dollar budget is going to special education. Wow. Next year, it'll be close to 3.3 million. Mm. So it shows you the growth. Mm -hmm. And again, you'll see that in the enrollment numbers when we get to there. Um, so that, that's a piece that we have a little control over, um, but not a lot. The only way to fix that is to change the structures that we're using, which the state's requiring us to do anyway. Change um, the structure? Of, that's what of, they're... Of special education, yeah. 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 And, and the big piece is that, that, uh, that they're really pushing for is you know, the quality first instruction, what's happening in the classroom to engage most kids. Um, which is appropriate. Um, I'm also, because I still can't get a clear picture of how special education is structured, especially at the elementary schools. Um, I've been doing tours with the principals, and each time I do a tour, I target in on something specific. So the next couple of weeks, it's targeting in on, I, I told them I want to see um, every special educator, I want to see every interventionist and every para, so that I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I might be able to make recommendations um, in terms of structural changes that, that might be able some cost there. Um, I built 
built two different special education programs in my life, but again, I don't have enough of a grasp on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure they do all the time either, um, because I've, I've tried to have them describe it to me last year, and I, I couldn't get it. Um, so I think it's just important to go in and take a look to so see what comes from that. Other questions on budgetary fees? So this is, is this your dream budget? Is a 14.9%? That's, that's, the, that's the fantasy budget. The fantasy budget increase. Ain't, ain't going ain't to happen, but it's what, what the, uh, the principals are saying is necessary to get us where we're And a 5.73% increase at the tech center? Yep. Okay. Well, we, could, we can talk a little bit about that, that if you want, but it outlines what he's looking for. Um, that budget's separate from the... From our budget, right. there's only 87 percent reimbursement from the state. Um, he, if I remember, I want to speak off the cuff. I don't remember what he's looking for. About a van. He's actually um, one of the problems. One of the things that, that's affecting the technical center this year. We can actually talk about the meetings on the 15th um, for the the board meeting for them. Is uh, their based their reimbursement is based on a rolling six semester. Um, attendance. So in other words, you know, the higher the enrollments are over on average over the, the previous six semesters, the more reimbursement you get. Um, the year before I came, they were at an all-time low. And so that all-time low is, uh, I think it was 120 or 122 students. That is still in the mix dragging down the reimbursement rate. Um, we are at a pretty good high right now. Um, they were up to 155. They're at about 147 right now. But they have another four or five students that will be moving into the program over the next month. Um, so if that continues, um, that average is going to go up and the cost of tuition will go down. Um, but they're, they're in a pretty good place. I talked with Jason um, as part of this process, and uh, he made an interesting comment. He said he's not too worried about the tuition piece um, going up this year because 147 students is their sweet spot. Uh, the building is designed uh, for that many. Um, yes, there is a little more capacity there. They're only allowed to have 12 um, in each of the programs. Um, but if they get much more, you know, you're going to start running into safety issues in the programs with the space that they've got. Um, so he'd like to keep it, you know, hovering right around that one, 145 to 150 range uh, on average. And again, if we can keep it there, you know, over the course of time, that average is going to go up and the reimbursement will be there. So he was looking at uh, the pre-tech program. Um, potentially, I don't think we need to. Um, we came up with some alternatives to this, but potentially a, a full-time teacher. Um, the pre-tech program is a state mandate. Um, if we get it into place, you know, there will be some reimbursement because there will be students coming from sending schools um, to take advantage of it. And I believe the grade range for this is 5 to 12. Um, so it's touching on some of the younger students and getting them involved, involved earlier. Um, the Farm to School program has been very successful. Uh, there's been a lot of educational programming around it. Um, the first year, which was last year, it was primarily grant uh, funded. We have applied for the grant again, but it's unlikely we'll receive it two years in a row. Um, so we're looking for an increase to that program to keep it up and running. Um, and it has supported, you know, hunger reduction in the community, um, which has been great. Um, they're looking for an eight-student um, transport van for $16,000. Um, the van that they currently have um, is uh, 2000 was when it was purchased. It's got very high miles on it. It's just not reliable. Um, and they're looking for an eight-person van because at that size, you don't have to have a, a commercial driver's license to run it. Um, and then he was looking to uh, move uh, a full, the equivalent of a full-time person off of the Perkins grant, kind of like what we were talking about with the Titles grant. The problem is, is that with the Perkins grant, those folks never really should have been on there, so he was surprised that he was getting them. Um, so they're going to get booted off at some point in time. And then he was looking for some uh, facilities upgrades. Um, he wanted the lockers removed to set up some benches so when the kids are doing uh, their project work out in the halls, they got a nice place to be. Um, talked about uh, the creation of an outdoor classroom, a little pergola um, to put out there um, so that they can do their work. And then the mechanical labs um, have to start being up updated. So that money wouldn't allow all of them to be updated, but you know, a little bit here and there over the course of time, we'll get them all into shape within a couple of years. Uh, 
up to where they need to be. Um, he was looking for 15,000 in travel um, because there's a lot of students, especially in the diesel program, that go off to national competitions and do exceptionally well. And this has helped pay for the travel. Um, there have been a lot of issues with um, students vaping in the, the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a sensor system out there that could go through the entire school. Um, the, it's actually a pretty cool, it's got some artificial intelligence in it. Um, it can tell if they're vaping, it can tell if they're smoking. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't set off an alarm, but it sends a text message uh, to the principal, lets it know. <laughs> the other thing that it does that it's really cool is it monitors the noises and the motions. And it can tell if it looks like a fight's about to break out or if there's some bullying or harassment going on. And it will send out a, a text message as well. So Does we'll, it record this stuff? Uh, potentially, I think it could. Yeah, it could. Yeah, potentially mm -hmm. it could. I wonder if that's a privacy issue yeah. in the bathroom. Yeah, it's only well, it's not, a, it, it's not recording visual images. It's just recording the sounds. Okay. And, and not physically the sounds, just, OK, on the risk meter, Okay. Here it is. Yeah. So you so might it's want not to recording check what out. they're saying. It's not recording their voices. It would nope. be recording uh, it's a noise gargle or a it pitches. Yeah. Like this. In this case, it would be okay. You know, the, the noises that okay. I'm, I'm hearing and interpreting are putting it in the risk range. You might want to go down and check. Gotcha. The heated voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Heated yeah. voices. <laughs> but it can. It's got the motion sensors. So depending upon how frenetic the motions are in there, it can detect that as well. So it's actually a pretty cool system when he's talking about it. Hmm. That is cool. It is. That's interesting. Yeah. The um, other piece there is uh, you can see some, some increases in terms of facilities. Um, they're having trouble getting quality people um, to work. I think that's been his. RCCC? Uh, no, this is for facilities for custodial. Oh, custodial. And, yeah. Um, so they're looking to contract a few things out. Um, one of them is the lawn mowing service. It's actually cheaper. Um, to contract it out to make sure that the uh, athletic mowing and the, the fields and whatnot get done the way that they need to. Um, the other piece is they're looking at bringing in an HVAC of hiring mm -hmm. one, having them on staff so that we're not paying uh, contract uh, fees to go out to the vendors. Um, one of the things is, is that things were not maintained here um, well. Uh, there has been a significant amount of work um, that had to go in this past year just to get things up and running in terms of HVAC and water and plumbing. Is um, that at the tech center? That's across the district. Oh. So the HVAC would be across the district. Um, he would come in, he would be able to do that work and hopefully over the course of a few years get things up to speed um, and, and save a significant amount of money there. So this person, full time job would simply be to take care of HVAC? Across the district. Mm -hmm. Each yeah. school? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, other things to be aware of is I th think we touched on this a, a little while ago um, was the fact that they're increasing the rent on the garage up here um, going from 12000 to 25000 um, The reality is as we checked other alternatives, um, it's still the cheapest um, and they're guaranteeing that they will not change the rent for at least 10 years and it's not an actual lock-in lease we could leave at any time. Um, so I've, I let uh, let um, the town offices, Adolfo, know that okay, you know, we check 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 what's there. You know, we're we're happy to continue this, mm -hmm. um, but you got to get the paperwork together for us to kind of review from from the legal mm -hmm. um, So that's that's where we're at on that that process. So uh, just one question with the HVAC um, backing up a little bit. Uh, when you started, we had the issue of of. Was it the electrician or the plumber or both were not full-time employees? Did we also do that at all, or they were trying to get? They had another. They had another category. They had custodians, and then I, I don't remember the other other word, but it was people that were a little bit more skilled, right. not licensed. We but didn't have skill. That skilled. was the issue. We you had. couldn't you couldn't find them if you wanted to. Okay. Um, so we're looking for the full HVAC, and like I said, there is significant work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, even just replacing the filters, I mean, one of the reasons the heat didn't work here last year um, was because they hadn't replaced the basic filters for years and years and years up there. So when the, the machine kicked on, the darn filters were so clogged up they got sucked into the moving parts and stopped things from moving. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's been, there's significant okay. pieces that need to be done. Other pieces there, another 16000 for snow removal to put it in line with what last year's spending was. Um, the other piece that's kind of a little odd, um, there is a mentoring program for teachers that's required under statute. 
so that new teachers that come in, you know, they get a, a, a veteran teacher that works with them. Um, that, for whatever reason, and why the state had ever accepted it, I don't know, was always put into title, which is not appropriate, never should have been there, so we're trying to pull that out of title. Um, there are some questions that I have about the mentoring program that's not going to keep people um, very happy. Um, when I saw what we're paying, um, it's two and three times what we paid in Massachusetts. Um, I did talk with the superintendents um, that are in the, the White River Valley. Um, the maximum they pay for a coordinator is 1800 We pay 6000 the maximum that they pay for an actual mentor is 700 We pay about 2500 per person. Is there a reason? Were we doing it as a it's, perk or something like that? I have no or? idea. Um, one of the, the, the pieces is that, you know, typically in a CBA, it spells these things out. Um, I give I give Brent a lot of credit. He kept that CBA very, kept as much out of it as possible mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. to, to provide flexibility, which is a good thing. So I don't know his rationale um, when, he, when, he, when he chose this. Um, it could be changed at any time, but you know that, that $30,000, $40,000 program that we're running this year for mentoring should have cost, should have cost this year we had a lot of people, should have cost about $10,000, hmm. somewhere in that game. Well, if I remember correctly, he used to go out, not just in this region, but he would go out right. to the entire state and look and see what, yeah. and try and you look like yeah. medians. Or we're, we're required to under yeah. executive limitations require us to. Right. 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 So, so when you when you went out, you only looked at this. I looked this at the, the White White River Valley, which is so there's about fifty seven superintendents. There were twelve to fourteen of them there that day. So it's a pretty good sampling. And it's in our region. You, know, you, we, you wouldn't expect to be paying what, you know, Chipman County, some of the schools. Right. In but County. I think he used to go a little bit higher just trying to yeah. right. That's what create quality yep. instruction and yeah. but this is you people. know triple triple mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Right. So right. so there, there there probably was was recent I don't know the context. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, don't know and I, I talked with Robin she doesn't know the context either. Um, she did there was a, something that she remembers there was a reason for it but she couldn't recall. Mm -hmm. But again not something I want to touch at this point time um, for morale reasons. Um, like it says, this uh, the total budget here includes the three, uh, uh, an assumed 3% increase for staff salaries um, and also the 11.8% increase for health insurance that they've already told us is coming. Okay. All right, so we'll revisit this in December with a lot closer than reality. Numbers. Yeah. Great, thanks, Lynn. And next, uh, is there any question or comment from either of you? Um, so included in our packet, I believe, are dates for the next negotiations with unions. Yeah, so the next next four dates for both um, the, the CBA meetings and the support staff negotiated meetings are already set. Um, what was nice is um, both parties agreed that these are open meetings. Excellent. So anybody in the community can come. Um, I've already invited the press. So that's going to be advertised as open and published. Yeah. Okay, great. Change. Um, while we're on um, negotiations, we'll see on the bottom of your um, school board member um, address form. Um, because we lost a couple of members, we also have lost um, people that we need in these um, duties, these committee responsibilities. So we need one person um, on the teacher negotiation team and we need one person on support staff negotiation team. We also need a board member to sign in the absence of the chair. So um, you can see here Paul and Melody are on the teacher negotiation team and they, um, and Ann Howard and Rachel are on the support staff negotiations. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have um, the willingness to join one of those two committees? I'm willing to be on the teachers as well. Okay. I'm willing to do it. I'll be on either one. Okay. Would you do the support staff then? Sure. Okay. Great. And then you guys should vote them in. Uh, we'll have one more thing. And we is some, Yeah, we oh, need to oh. vote them in. But is there someone who sort of lives not far from the OSSD office who's able to and willing to stop by the um, office to sign 
in case uh, a signature is needed? Uh, I, I could probably do that. Okay. We'll add that uh, you to that then. Okay. And cap. All right. So we've got um, three nominations. Anne Howard to add to the teacher negotiation staff. Um, Ashley to add to the support staff uh, negotiations and and Kaplan to sign in the absence of chair. Do I have a motion to approve those? I'll make that motion to approve the nominees for teacher negotiations, support staff negotiations, and board member to sign in absence of chair. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Linda here, or did you get me? I got it. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we're up to you again, Lane. We've got the climate survey presentation. So this one is, uh, the other other ones are pretty short, that, you know, that we'll talk about tonight. Um, this one is a little bit longer. It depends upon the conversation that you guys have and the questions, which will be good. Um, so the cli climate survey, a um, couple things to remember um, is that starting at the, in this spring, the state, um, is required under ESSA, under the old No Child Left Behind Act, um, to do a climate survey and use that as part of their, their, their report card um, that they give out on the schools and the district and the state as a, as a whole. So that will take the place of, of what's been done here before. Um, the first of these climate surveys um, was administered in 2009. Um, it was a common survey that the, the Winooski Valley Superintendents <coughs> Association used. Um, it was given every other year. Um, there was a four-year gap between 2013 and 2017, right? If you're offering it every other year, then they missed a year in terms of administering the survey. Um, there were some response changes um, in 2017, 16-17. Um, they had a neutral piece, right? It's, you know, agrees, strongly agrees, disagrees, strongly disagrees, neutral was in the middle. For some reason, they changed it to sometimes in 2017. Um, it does not look, and after I got the context of what was going on that year, it does not look that that had an overall impact in the survey data. Um, and then in terms of the survey that I just did, uh, that I put out, um, I went back to neutral for that center one, but I also added, you know, doesn't does not apply to Humphrey. Um, in terms of kind of looking over the survey as a whole, um, there were some confusion, um, you could tell in the comments uh, that were there, of who was being referred to. You know, is it the students that we're, we're, we're rating on this, or how we, or is it, is it ourselves? Um, so there was some That's of that. That's too bad. That's not good. Um, but that had been going on for, since 2009, so hopefully when the state puts their survey out, they're a little clearer. Um, I took, there was, the survey that was given out in the past was huge. Um, it sounded like the, the board was really interested in kind of climate and morale, so mm -hmm. I focused on the 22 questions um, that kind of looked at quality of life. The one thing that I do want to point out is um, these are bar graphs, so you've got to be careful on the, the Y scaling. Um, mm -hmm. For some reason in Excel, you can't adjust that. So in some cases, the scores are really high, but because the scaling, they, they don't look it. So oh, I'll try to point okay. those out. That's interesting. Them. All right. So... Uh, what these numbers represent, so if you look at that 77 for 2011, that means that 77% of the respondents in 2011 either agreed or strongly agreed. So in all these cases, it's the sum of the agrees and the strongly agrees. So students aren't eager to learn was the question. Um, and then kind of in going through the comments, there were seven of them. Um, and basic theme of it was there was a lot of concern about the growing number of students with trauma-based behaviors. And this was interesting, the wording that was used, um, statements that too many are not emotionally available was the word that kept coming up. And that was in 2011? Uh, right that's now. this year. Oh, this year. Uh, for learning um, or school and that this number is growing. So that's so the, is it, who's taking this survey? Uh, so this survey was administered to teachers, all faculty. Teachers, teachers. It, no, oh, okay. teachers custodians, bus drivers, okay. uh, every employee right. in the district. And how okay. many, like what's your end? Um, you said 66%. So 66% um, either agreed or strongly agreed. Right, but the I, students are when you look at way. those numbers, I'm just wondering year to year, like are there 
25 people? Are there so, 75 um, people? Like yeah. statistical? Statistically, in looking back, uh, the previous years were about 89 respondents. This year was 91. Okay. So it was kind of pretty much in line. And how many employees could have filled this out? Uh, probably 100 to 120. So that's an incredible rate of return then. Yeah. For, for a survey. And this was K-12? Yep. Entire district went out to, like I said, it went out to bus drivers, custodians, cafeteria, everybody. Okay. I don't, and I think that was the case in the past from what I, I could gather. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep it as close to what the case in the past was. Uh, students have a positive attitude towards school. Um, so I'll give you some of these are exact quotes. Um, again, the comments, typically there were about five, five to seven comments. Um, students have a negative attitude towards school uh, because the system has failed to provide them with tools necessary for success, namely high quality instructors and guaranteed time for those instructors. So I think this is a, a very telling one because it, it plays along this theme of where time is being spent, right? Are, are, are they saying that their colleagues are not well qualified to be teachers? That's what they're saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, if you think about seventh grade math last yeah. year is an example, and we do have trouble in certain, as what, which is true across the state, of getting um, people, mathematics, foreign language is typically dif difficult, some of the sciences. Um, so there is difficulty uh, because there's a shortage out there of getting top-notch people. Yeah. So you, you read the same thing that I did. Um, but a lot of it, too, it feels like it's about, um, it's about uh, you know, where they're spending their time. Um, the other pieces that we came up with, because the cabinet and I went through this last week um, to get their opinions along the way as well. Um, and then this will be distributed out to the full staff after today. I said, let, let me present it to the board first, and you can do what you need to with it. Um, the other piece is the, the, the growing number of paraprofessionals, right? Um, because while they are effective with the kids, they're not really trained to do a lot of you know, academic work with them. Um, another comment, I think this is, there is an upward trend towards students having a more positive attitudes towards school. Um, and then another one, again, that word again, if they are emotionally available, they are eager and positive about putting in effort. So again, this need to address the trauma-based behaviors that we're seeing. Students are willing to put in effort to learn. Uh, there are many students who show excitement about learning and being in school. There are more who, while they do what they need to to get by, they are not truly engaged. The rest of the student base are struggling to manage trauma-related stress and behaviors, so that is not really possible for them to be a part of classroom learning. So 62%, a little up from the previous year. Again, there was a, there, uh, contextually, there was a lot going on in 2016-17, um, and so you're going to see you know, a big drop from previous years. Morale is high, and this one is interesting. Um, most of this uh, dealt with teacher stress um, in terms of spending a lot of time in meetings that are not directly related to the teaching task. That's what they, their comments? Yeah, I'm going to so read 53% of our district is thinks our morale is low. If 47% uh, neut neut neutral, neutral or low. Neutral or low? Low. Okay. Um, so, but again, it, it depends on, you know, the, the causes of it. So let me read some comments, and then I'll, I'll make one more comment that I don't want to lose on the vicarious nature of stress. Um, there is an undercurrent of stress about meetings, lack of planning time, and feeling we don't have adequate teaching time. I would say all love school, but are feeling overwhelmed with initiatives and the mental health issues of the students. Stress was added due to the late start of the interventionists, which we spoke about a little November. bit. The title folks, mm -hmm. yeah. Teacher morale is extremely high. Um, for the majority of students, morale is high. This was one of the ones where people were confused. Are we talking about the students or about mm -hmm. us? Um, support teachers by guaranteeing two types of work. Time directly involved with students and time analyzing student work and planning for instruction. So again, they really want to be focused on, on the classroom piece. And I think a lot of this relates back to the um, standards-based report card work and the, 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 the uh, graduation proficiencies. Much improved, higher than previous year. Um, the rest of the comments dealt with misspelling of 
morale. <laughs> no, 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 morals. Uh, some of the again, there were. I try to put it. I try to put in the critical ones too, especially the most critical ones. Um, both the superintendent and the principals consistently make efforts to establish means versus supporting ends, um, despite neither having taught a regular course load in over a decade. Well, the reality was, is I was a full-time teacher prior to starting here because I took time off from administration work with my parents. And I taught freshman uh, physics in one of the most prestigious schools, public schools, and most diverse schools in the country. And my kids scored higher than any students here um, when I got done the year, so that is not true. But for that, they're just for fun. <laughs> so, quick question. Yep. When is this administered? This was administered uh, in October of this October? year. October? Were all of these in October? Do you know? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, because they had to report to you. And so when did you start? Which? Wh uh, was so it October of 2017? I was not here for this administration. That was 2016 17. They always put down the last. Uh, okay, the last so that's year. what I'm trying to figure out. So the only, the, this last column is the only ones that it, it applies to my time frame. Okay. Uh, this is a good place to work, and this is one you have to be careful of, uh, the axes, right? 76% this year are saying that this is a good place to work. Um, strongly agree or agree. Um, and again, it's kind of funny because you're going to see some of these are really high, which kind of, you know, the morale piece and the... I look forward to Mondays, I really do. Uh, much improved over last year. Um, after last year, I find this place uh, to be refreshingly pleasant um, and you guys remember all the stuff that happened last year in terms of personnel um, I am in a supportive environment but stress levels are running high um, and again I think that's a referral back to uh, where mm -hmm. they're spending their time RTCC is the best school I have worked in in over 20 years mm -hmm. and again my analysis and in, in talking with the cabinet um, and actually some of the, 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 the faculty um, it seems uh, that too much time is being directed by administration and not enough time being given uh, to teachers to focus on implementation of changes that's going to affect, uh, directly impact learning. School provides a high quality education. Again, be careful of the axis. Um, it's at 76%, uh, which is fairly high. Um, in general, they feel there's too much testing at the elementary level. Um, there's a concern about the lack of science education at the elementary level. Um, there is a limit to the quality uh, because of student engagement, prior knowledge, and mental health issues. Uh, the district does what it's capable of doing based on budget and the size of the student body. Um, and again, another theme in there is that students need more time with their teachers. So quick question about the testing comment. Um, the testing going on at elementary level, is that state driven or is it stuff that we've, we've said we want to test in our district? Uh, so it's, it's things that the elementary principals have put into place. So we talk about those three tiers in curriculum. Curriculum is down. Once you start implementing the curriculum, you start taking a look at what the students are learning and what's not. So they developed a whole variety of different uh, testing mechanisms um, to give feedback to the teachers on what's going well and what's not. You know, they talked about their combative formative assessments in ELA. Um, the reality is, is they've got too many that are going on. Um, mm. The principals recognize this. But what they're trying to do, they also bought the, they bought a program this year. And if I wasn't tired, I would remember the name mm -hmm. of it, that the kids will take, you know, like a 15-minute exam and it gives them immediate feedback on, mm -hmm on um, you know, what standards are weak. They've got too many going on, but what the principals are saying is, yeah, we're gonna continue it for this year so that at the end of the year, we can take a look at which is the most effective um, for what they're using it for and drop the rest. Okay. Um, so that, that will change. So the principals are aware oh, and yeah. they're going to address? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, like they said, is they got all these different ones. We're gonna use them. We're gonna see which ones are actually the most valuable for the faculty, because some of them are redundant and then we're gonna get rid of the, get rid of the rest. Physical plant is well suited to student needs. It's at 64%. Um, the temperature is unbearably hot at the beginning and end of the, the year, um, which is true, especially at the high school. But what's interesting, you know, if we get the get the solar panels up there, we can get the heat exchangers in and 
we could air condition the schools. Imagine what a draw that would be across the state. <laughs> you, you think you think I'm kidding? Oh, we had no. we had full air conditioning in Swampscott. <laughs> but in Massachusetts, yeah, <laughs> small school. There was uh, high school was only 650 kids. No, I said it, that's yeah. Massachusetts though. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Difference between Massachusetts and Vermont is in Massachusetts the town pays for the educational costs. It's not spread out across the. The state, you get a little bit from the state to help, but it's not much. Um, we can't drink our water, so guess which school this is. <laughs> However, there is a huge improvement in work order, tickets getting completed faster. Um, and then chairs, desks, and furniture need to be updated. The furniture does not fit the size of the upper grade students in the elementary schools. Is that true? Apparently. <laughs> I asked the principals about that, and they're like, Maybe. So, they, <laughs> so they're, they're, they're actually checking on that. But, you know, I'd hate to think those little orange chairs, you know, the sixth graders are sitting I, I hate that. I haven't seen it during the walkthroughs. It looks appropriate, but you know, it may not be true in every classroom. It may not be true, uh, true in every elementary chairs. school. Yeah. They're a little low, but it's okay. The school's <laughs> physical <laughs> plant is kept clean. Again, this one's higher than it looks based on the scaling. It's at 76%. Um, the general feeling is the facility, so this is somebody's comment, team is doing a tremendous job within the constraints of their staffing size. Uh, they recognize the staff does that it's hard for them to keep, keep staff long term. Uh, the quality just isn't there. Physical plant is repaired promptly um, at 57 percent. Um, and these are quotes. They inherited a mess and are making great strides. We need another person for light fixer upper jobs. A valiant effort is being made to update an aging building. Um, despite working with a small staff and limited funds. Um, things have improved in this. There's a long way to go, but repairs are occurring. And then kind of the old classroom piece here, uh, old equipment in the classrooms, and the heat did not work for two weeks. That was at the high school. <laughs> so, but that was, a, that was another long-standing maintenance issue. Um, the heating system at the high school has two pumps that circulate the water. Mm -hmm. um, they're designed for one to run for a while, the other one to run for a while, mm -hmm. so they don't burn out. Right. Well, one crapped the bed about four years ago was never replaced. So one pump was running constantly um, to heat the school there. And those pumps are expensive. They're between seven and fifteen thousand dollars a piece. Um, and so they ordered it with the surplus money. They actually they ordered two of them, you know, one to replace the one that had failed and one to put on the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, with the surplus money it just took forever for it to get in this year. Um, I have a feeling that that system is old enough they probably had to manufacture them from scratch. So that is in place, but again, you know, we talk about maintenance that was done and not. Yeah, so we're lucky there wasn't more damage there. Uh, my assigned responsibilities are fair and reasonable, 67%. Um, and again, we go back to a common theme. The number of hours spent not directly on student achievement is fatiguing. Uh, there are too many things beyond teaching responsibility or responsibilities added that we are not trained for. Are, are these temporary things? Like, are they doing? Yeah, this most of what we can tell is um, most of them, you know, deal with the trauma-based behaviors, right? They're not trained to deal with those really well in the classroom for the high-level ones. Um, I think it has to do with the high school. It has to do with a new grading system. It has to do with the graduation proficiencies. Remember, they have spent close to three years, if not more, of their time yeah. at every meeting for the most part working on this. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that's that's got to be a little bit frustrating. Um, again, you got to be careful with this one because of the scaling. I feel safe <laughs> at school. And there's some context like here. 84, yeah, 84 percent feel safe at school. You have to remember last year everything that went on um, mm -hmm. in the community um, and some of the incidents that happened in the schools. Last year we did the safety survey. This question was on it. Mm -hmm. Last year it was 52 percent. So in one year it's gone from 52 to 84 percent, which is a pretty good job. Um, there were only a couple of comments on this. Um, one of them had to do about the ability to leave the doors unlocked. Um, they do have buttons now to help unlock and unlock. And then with the new changes that happened at the beginning of this year um, with uh, Alice um, and changing around how they kind of respond to emergency threats, um, a couple of folks are concerned that they got to speed up their response during the drills, which makes sense because it's, it's new. Um, but that is happening. Um, I am satisfied with the quality of leadership of the superintendent um, is at 70%. Um, and I'll put some of the negative ones in here, which don't really 
or too much. Superintendent does not seem to fully comprehend the responsibilities of elementary educators. Um, I upset um, the elementary educators uh, a bit when I was sending out the emails kind of outlining the vision for this year. Um, they were very upset about the word generalist. Uh, they thought it was derogatory. It was not meant to be. Um, generalist to me just means that you teach more than one discipline. Mm -hmm. It's actually a, a pretty hard road to hoe. Um, they felt, that I used the expression, you know, our use of uh, paraeducators is a band-aid fix. It is. Um, the paraeducators felt that that was derogatory towards them. It was not. It was derogatory towards the structure we're using, mm -hmm. um, which was intended. And we talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, the other one was um, some of the special educators. I made the statement in the, the emails that I was sending out um, under students with disabilities. Um, under the law um, is the idea that they're at average intelligence or above, and they took issue with that. And then I pointed out the laws to them, and um, yeah, your average intelligence or above, you can't be put on a uh, IEP for having um, below average intelligence. Um, they do have an intellectual disability that people can qualify for, but you have to be below average intelligence and two other things, have maladaptive behavior that prevents you from learning at your capacity. Um, what bothered me a little bit about this um, was the fact of all the information that was there and all the analysis and all the data and talking about the ends and why they were important. These were the only things that they wanted to discuss. So I have a feeling that we're touching on a sensitive issue um, with the faculty, which is the academic performance. And it's going to take them a little bit of time to realize nobody's being beat up over this. Uh, we're trying to give you tools. We're trying to give you focus and trying to help you along the way. Um, it is what it is. There's no blame here. We've got to provide the tools and the structure to help them succeed. Um, the other piece, uh, I sent out the Massachusetts curriculum. Um, some of them were concerned um, that I was trying to use that to replace what they're doing. That was not the case. I talked with them about that. It's a tool. Uh, those curriculum documents were tied to the Common Core a long time ago. They have been revised and researched since 1993. And I sent it out primarily for the high school folks because they do not have curriculums, most of them. And the idea is, okay, if you're teaching this year and you need a tool to guide you, here you go. Um, until we get time after January to start to develop our All right, so. What about some of the positive? We do need to be mindful, a little uh, mindful of time, just so we know. We're already over. I feel that. And we still have enrollment presentation. Yeah. While sincere efforts are being made, there's, there are still ways to go in creating a cohesive team feeling. I think administration is being stretched too thin mm -hmm. in all that they are expected to accomplish. There was a lot of push for a curriculum director. Uh, Concern again over you know trying to put a stop to the work on the graduation proficiencies and standard-based report cards, but that hadn't been done. Satisfied with the quality of leadership, school administrator, 79%. Um, only one comment was a positive response about the principal at Brookfield and a statement that he needs to be there more often, which we kind of discussed tonight. Satisfied with the quality of leadership, the teacher leaders was at 71%. Um, the only comment that was there was the recognition that not all the schools have teacher leaders. Quality Leadership School Board um, was not a lot of comments on this. Um, comment wishing that there was more interaction between the board and teachers. Um, We're not allowed no. to interact with the teachers. Yeah. Well, I, and I wonder, again, I'm sorry, because I, I just run into this all the time, is just, I think it's really important, and we haven't done it, is to meet with the staff and help them understand how we operate, because I think we get that kind of a rating, because people think we're going to be micromanaging what's going on, and we're going to be telling you how to do your job. And the way we govern, we don't tell you how to do your job. We look at, we say, we want you to produce this, and we say, show us the data. Show us that you've produced what we said we wanted you to produce. 
And and I think if we can do that, our numbers probably go up. <laughs> well, I think, I, I think people don't understand. They, I think I mean, there's the public doesn't understand. another piece to it. Um, I think there's two pieces to it. Um, one of the pieces is is the separation between the board and the community. Um, the further away you get from interacting because of, of your position, the more likely folks are depending upon what they hear as opposed to their own direct experience. So that's very true with the board. You know, usually mm -hmm. the people that come before us, it's because there is a concern that they have. Right. Um, and then that, whatever, however that is resolved, um, you know, that's what the, the speak in the community is. And because the rest of the community hasn't interacted with you directly, they listen to what they hear. That's true with the, the superintendent. A little less true with the principals, you know, not very true in terms of the, the, the teachers. Again, as you get further away um, through the hierarchy. Well, I certainly can't imagine that they actually would want some of the um, board teacher interactions that I've been privy to from yeah. other districts. Yeah. Like, I have, a, I have, you know, I've studied education in college, so I have a lot of friends from college who were, who were teachers and having board members just show up in their classroom and sit there for three or four hours and not talk to them and yeah. then wander away and wonder on earth what that was about. Yeah. But again, <laughs> you don't want that it's, at all. It's, it's, it's just, like I said, it's, it's interesting. The other piece, too, is that... Um, you know, 2016-17 was a tough year. It was. Mm -hmm. it, and it was. I'm happy with some of the administration stuff oh. that was going on. Who's responsible for that? They're right. gonna, they're gonna, so mm -hmm. it makes complete sense that they're... So that, that was part of it is, you know, why, why wasn't it dealt with? Right. So there was, there was right. a lot of... It makes, it makes sense. a lot of sense. Um, local efforts to improve education are headed in the right direction. It's up. It's at 60% from the previous year. Mm -hmm. um, again, but it's that same theme. We need fewer initiatives to work more deeply on the ones we have. Uh, the efforts that are being set in motion this year seem to be steps in the right direction to support children dealing with trauma as well as to improve academics. Supporting and providing enriching opportunities for students who are performing at grade level or excelling is also an important um, tool that should not be lost. Uh, decision making is inclusive of the school community, uh, 46%. Uh, decision making at each level in the district is dominated by loud voices rather than common sense. So it sounds like they're talking a little about, about the community. Um, what, what, could I, I? I'm not clear what this question is asking. Yeah, it's it's hard to tell. Um, hmm. Hard to tell. This is one of the ones um, where I would sit down actually with the faculty. Um, and I have a protocol that I usually use, and it, it's something like this, you know, um, I'm not going to respond um, in turn or defend, you know, anything that's up here. My job is to get clarity and to, and to hear why the numbers are the way that they are. And usually through that conversation, you get an idea of how they interpreted the question. How do they interpret the question? Uh, it sounds like it's a community thing, too much weight, because there, there are a couple of these. So decision making is dominated by loud voices, too much weight is given to squeaky wheels, and many voices are missed. Okay, so it's not the school community that they're talking about, it's the larger community yeah. that's, okay. Uh, decision making continues to be non-transparent. So wait, why do you want, I mean, how? Again, I, I was this keeping. Is a, this is for your teachers. These aren't, but these aren't my questions. I was repeating what was in the old okay. surveys. Okay, all right. Because um, how do the teachers even how are they even aware of that? Well, their, inter their interactions. See, how I would interpret it is, okay, if I'm having a, a meeting with my principal, um, is there a back and forth? Is it a discussion or are we just told what we're doing? Right. So that's not about the, the wider community. It, it, it isn't... But it seems they interpreting that, that as the. It sounds like that either that or when they're in those meetings, um, it sounds like there are some people that are dominating the conversation, and so not all the voices. Teachers' are meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be. Okay. Okay. That's that's okay. I thought you were saying the school community, like parents, and I'm like, when would that ever be happening? Yeah. Again, that that's how I would interpret. It doesn't mean that's how they did. Okay. Um, decision making, decisions being made on how we feel as opposed to educational research. Um, I appreciate that the superintendent is very transparent with the community, keeping us aware of what's going on. See, that it, sounds like the community. Yeah. As right. it happens right. through email and phone, including having forums for discussion. 
through. It, uh, it's apparent that he intends to implement changes to improve our district. I feel very positive about this. However, I'm not aware of whole staff meetings discussing asking for feedback or looking at plans. So again, that's what I was saying is I have not had the opportunity because the principals grab all the time um, to actually talk about the vision, which is why I was sending the emails out. That was my way of getting the vision out and things that we've been discussing behind the scenes to get them talking and thinking. So it was interesting. Uh, decision making is respectful. There were no comments on it, but they headed at 61%. Uh, decision making is fair. Again, no comments on it. Uh, Forty-six percent. But yeah. that kind of goes fair. along with the previous one that we had about, um, you know, all voices are heard or yeah. not. That's that's for you. This is one that didn't exist before. Uh, I feel comfortable talking with administration about any concerns I may have at seventy-five percent. Uh, I feel hmm. cared about here. Seventy-eight percent. That's not bad. That's not <laughs> and then, oops. And then, yeah, it's because of the scaling. Uh, the only concerns that were listed uh, were things that were kind of out of control. Um, commenting on that there's not enough paid leave, paid days for maternity leave. Um, nursing room is not ready. They were putting in a room to allow teachers with, with children to be able to nurse, um, and it's not complete yet. And superintendent making suggestions on curriculum. It's funny. This is the same voice in a couple of these. Across the board, without having any knowledge of the curriculum. Well, I hope that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. Yeah. yeah. yeah I got 50 Wait, years. This is not. <laughs> this is so Difficult problems are addressed, not avoided. Um, so this is a new one. That's why there's no previous data there. Um, I believe the district responds in the best way it can to issues passed down from government and cultural, social issues common in our present world. I think it's getting better, but I feel that we are so focused on the graduation requirements and the, the proficiency-based report cards that we're losing sight of what we need. And that's it. I told you that was long. The other ones are short. And I can email this to you. I'm happy to email all the, the questions to you guys, the, the comments to you guys as well. Uh, but 90% of them were in the comments. Questions, thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. I don't need the email, but if everybody else feels like yeah. they do, then. If you do, you can shoot me an email. I'm happy to send that to you. But like I said, the comments and the, the survey results will be shared by the principals with the faculties um, for, for discussion, which yeah. I think is good. I think that's helpful feedback. Yep. All right, you're on again for the enrollment presentation. Oh, these are pretty quick. <laughs> I'll play that. Right. So what I did was was uh, sorry. And then was, we'll their meeting evaluator. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you got the point. What I did was three-year trends. Do you, do you to, no, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Careful. Just, uh, <laughs> Just to make it a little bigger, hopefully. So the three-year trends. So total district enrollment um, across the last three years. You see there. There was a dip last year, but there was a big increase um, the current year that we're in. Um, the three-year trend means that on average, we're gaining 11.5 students per year. Okay. Does this include the preschool at Braintree that's nope. new? Nope, does oh, not include great. preschool numbers. What about students that were leaving? I know there was a couple of years we had a lot of students leave. Is there any? I don't know if there was any truth to that. I have a feeling there were some high-profile students that left, but again, you get the voices that that you know, we'll talk about the fact. Oh, it's everybody going. I don't think that was the case. Uh, at least I look back. I only put the three years up here, but I did look back five years. Yeah, I was gonna say so. I, I, I seem to remember uh, students left from certain districts, but other districts grew. And yeah, so I think that was the, 2018. It, it, yeah. it was the high school. There's high profile right. going to Sharon Academy. Yeah. So right. This, mm -hmm. you know, that was yeah. that was a it. brain drain. A little bit of a brain drain. So brain tree. Um, elementary is growing about four students per year um, and it's on a nice upward trajectory so usually when you see a nice steep line like that and the dots are fairly close mm -hmm. to the line um, usually it's a pretty good indicator that for the next year or two that's going to continue. Uh, Brookfield and it's not as bad as it looks um, had a drop but it's had a significant jump back up and there's another significant jump about that size scheduled for next year. Uh, the, depending upon the kids that are in kindergarten and the pipeline and whatnot. Um, so the three-year trend line is they are dropping one student per year. But again, they had a huge jump last year. 
Uh, Randolph Elementary, again, you see the dots are nice and close together. It's a pretty good upward trend. On average, they're gaining 8.5 students per year. RUHS, they had a big drop in 18. That may be mm -hmm. potentially what you're referring to, uh, but an equal gain um, the year after. So there is no slope on that. It means things are flat. They've, they're back up to where they were. And so that's interesting with the sending two new buses that we haven't rebounded a little further, I would say. Right. One no. would, you know, I don't know the reason, again, for the 2017-18. The, the um, again, those students, those students coming in in 17-18 would have been enrolling um, in the spring of 16-17. Again, it seems to be making a rebound. And hopefully that two-year trend continues. I have a feeling it will. Mm -hmm. RTCC enrollment, on average, they're growing by eight students per year. Um, and again, right now, um, they're at that sweet spot, you know, around that 150 mark, 147. Questions on that? And then I want to just show you the SPED enrollments really quick because I think that's important. Again, this is a short one. Yeah, there's a lot of info in today's. So, got to understand what this is telling you. Um, this is SWD, students with disabilities, in other words, students that have IEPs. The percent of the total district enrollment. So in 2017, about 18% across the district of the students here were students with disabilities. So you can see that that number is growing. Every 1% gain is about nine students district-wide. So we're up, uh, so with 18 to 20, we're up 18, we're up about 20 students overall in the district. How does that compare to statewide? So statewide, um, again, I'm gonna give you my best estimate. It's higher in Vermont uh, because of all the trauma-based behavior across the state. Um, that trauma-based behavior is centered, dead center in, the, in Vermont, we have more of it. It's probably about 16%. National average is 10 to 12 percent. So we are way above it. Uh, in Massachusetts, if my students with disabilities enrollments ever got above uh, 12 percent, I got a very nasty letter from the Department of Ed. Uh, but let's break it down by school. It gets a little bit more interesting. So district brain tree. Uh, so 18.5 percent to 21 percent. Um, right, so they're growing at about 1.4 percent per year in terms of the percentage of their population um, that's a student with disabilities. Brookfield, they're at 26 percent, um, so they're more than double the national average, and it's growing at 6.2 percent per year. So that's where we talk about this need for these therapeutic. If it keeps going like this, the cost, the cost in terms of the special education program is just going to keep skyrocketing. And again, if you look at the numbers, what we talked about, they're pretty, the lines are straight and the dots are close. Mm -hmm. The it's further out mean. you project from there, you know, the less accurate it's going to be, but you can kind of be guaranteed for the next year or two. Mm -hmm. It's going to continue along. The so, way. I mean, my question is, you know, how much of this could be, you know, not just trauma-based, but Oh, there's you know, a, autism and other things that you actually have no, you know, redress for, really. So there's, 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 this isn't just the trauma base. My guess is, is that a lot of the growth is due to that. So you have the base where it started. Um, so there is a lot that's academic. But with a properly structured special education program, um, what you're doing is you're training the students with the academic disabilities the strategies they need to use to be able to do it for themselves, and so they eventually come off the IEPs. Uh, that's how it's supposed to work, and I'll show you some data on this in a minute. Um, and it, students with disabilities percentage uh, school enrollment at RES, it's going up by 3.1% per year. So, but you're looking at two, 2017 to 2019. How come you didn't look back? I mean. Have we always been about this? I mean, yeah, it looks like it's going up, but it's two, two years. It takes three years to establish a trend. And so I always stick with the most common, most current three years. 
So you know, next next year instead of you know 2016 to 2018, it'll it'll shift one. I could put more data up there. Um, well, so I'm my guess curious. is in, look, I mean, in looking like, back, it did something like really this that was high for a while, and then it did this. Well, yeah, I would be interested to see what it was like in 2010 yeah. and 2012. So, so see, why are you looking to put the interventionist, uh, the program that you were discussing in Mount Randolph, if the largest percentage is in Brookfield? Why would we not put it there? Rand Randolph has a smaller percentage at but around 20, number 20 percent, but a greater number of people means more kids overall. All right. Um, and it's central, um, so it's easy if you got to transport the kids from you know Braintree to, to Randolph and Brookfield to Randolph. If you had to go from Braintree to Brookfield or vice versa, that's a trip. That's a long time. Yeah. It always surprises me how long that it takes. Um, our RUHS. This is actually a good thing there, but but we got to dig a little bit deeper into the data. You know, the data is telling us it's going down by 1.25%. We don't know if that's because they're coming off IEPs. I don't believe that to be the case. I think it's because they're leaving the district. They get to the high school level, and at that point in time, you're able to drop out. You know, our, our dropout rates aren't bad, but there is about a 5% there. Um, these could be the kids that are leaving. What you want to see, if you're sure that um, the drop at the high school um, is due to students coming off IEPs, this is what you kind of want to see over time. You see how the high school trend is going down, even though the elementary is going up? At the elementary level, that's when you're identifying the students for IEPs, mm -hmm. right? They get their services for a while, and eventually they should come off them. So, you know, assuming, which again, I don't believe is true, I think they're leaving the district. Assuming these are students coming off IEPs, this is a good trend. This is what you want to but see. But the, the thing is, is they, the same amount would be dropping out all those years if it's at the high school, right? It may not have been special education students that were dropping out those previous years. I do know that a lot of the focus at the high school is on keeping students in school. I mean, right, I'm just, I'm just wondering about your rationale for that. You yeah. know, it seems yeah. they're all, it's all a high school population. It's not... Yeah. But again, who's most likely to drop out? Students at risk with learning disabilities. Um, students of poverty. Right, but the same... Again, I'm just again. I don't know the answer to this. There needs yeah, this. This is one of those ones that you need to dig deeper into to find out what's really going on. But it's just are you are you doing that? It's interesting. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, part of the the discussions. This is the data that you know we'll be talking with the um, the special education group with as I'm going around and doing my my observations. Uh, district wide students with autism it's going up at at uh, two point five per year. Um, so. So in this case, you got from all the way back from 2013 to yeah, 17. Yeah, had, had more data about, that was easier to, to grab with this. What about um, current? What about 18, 19, like all the other ones? So right now we're sitting at 15 this year. So you know, about about four or five years ago we were down around five. Now we're up at 15. So again, again, uh, you know, you're seeing that that's a pretty straight line with the dots pretty close to it. It's going up at 2.5 students per year. That one's probably going to continue for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, that's true across the nation. Um, there's there's a significant amount of growth in autism. All right. Thank you. And lastly, in this, we've got the review and approval of policy review contract with the VSBA. So um, what this is, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, the Vermont School Boards Association uh, has their legal team that is happy to review our policies um, to make sure that we've got everything in there that we're mandated to have and to make sure that they're in line with state regs and federal regs and local regs. Um, and so this is to pay them to do that review. And they'll provide feedback and recommendations that, you know, it's something that the, the board, um, you know, should engage in to update if it's necessary. Um, so that's what that's about. I don't know what they came up with for cost. It's, I want to say it's around $600. Yeah, typically it's in the $600. That's a lot. I don't think yeah. I have it with me. So we need to vote on that? Yeah, I think that's one that the board has to sign. I can't do it. Okay. So. I'd like to make the motion to approve the policy review contract with VSBA. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. All right. So we've got two um, 
EL reports 2.1 and 2.2, and I let our two new board members know that we were going to be reviewing these. Um, they were in our packet last month, and I believe, are they still in the I packet this month, too? Yeah, okay, sure. great. Just in case. Um, so hopefully people took the time um, to review these. I explained to Ann Kaplan and yeah, yeah. Ashley yeah. as well that yeah, we're now doing the, the monitoring this way, so everyone's clear on those expectations. I do have, I have full reports on them, but time-wise, you guys decide if you just want to ask questions. Or well, did you, was there anything you wanted to tell us about the way these were written or uh, these are, changes or adaptations? No, these are, were pretty short and straightforward mm -hmm. um, and in compliance across the board. And I threw, um, you know, as they talked about, is adding some of the evidence um, right into the reporting. Where, you know, I did that where it was possible. In some cases, um, it's a lack of evidence um, that shows that, that, that things are all right. Um, you know, one of them was like, you know, treating the staff respectfully, the fact that there's been no grievances by the, the board to that effect. Um, I had a question on um, one about. You in 2 1 or 2 2? Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the ends monitoring. <laughs> Sorry about that. Nope. Nope. I, that was an ends monitoring. Okay. So I didn't write down any questions. I guess I didn't have any. I have one. Can I be the a grump? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, well, coming back onto the board, I, I see we're continuing the to monitor in the way that we did in the past, and I know everyone sort of thinks we're doing policy governance, but we are not forcing him to create an operational definition so that he presents data and he and we have something that we can measure. It's just a bunch of words. Well, and that is why really we had this do it. Right. That's why we had this climate survey presentation because right. we, I, I asked him to, to do but that. He so. hasn't operationalized his definition in these. He needs to say it, there needs to be something measurable there. He needs to say 80% of the staff are going to respond to a, to a survey. It ha it, we have to have something there that we can measure, not reading through gobs of information that's just wordsmithing, defining things. It has to be a, a measurable, Data-driven data -driven answer, and we're not we're not getting that. And I'm not saying, you know, I just think we need to move that way, and perhaps it's more training on our part, perhaps on on the superintendent's part. But if we're really going to measure, we need to have data responses, and it needs to be more clean than what than what we're just doing what we did before, we're not moving forward in the way that we're, we're, we really need to be monitoring. If we're going to say that we are we're being policy and data driven, this is not it. I think some of the, the monitoring, you know, the policies really are not necessarily data driven. They're he's, more... He's got to figure out a way to do it. But I mean, that, they don't necessarily or, lend themselves to Or you guys to need be, to change Or we how, modify the yeah. policy. And I, I got a perfect example data. up here. So provision one, illicit information for which there is no clear necessity. You know, the this, this superintendent will not. I have the right to create the interpretation of that, right, um, right. correct? As, and right. as long as it's not out of bounds. Um, so the interpretation, I interpret this to mean that current, prospective, and former students and families will only be asked for information that is required for the district or its schools to make informed decisions that support board established ends or mandatory statutes. Mm -hmm. So again, this is one of those ones where the absence of is the, the How evidence. How about 100% of our forms do not ask for information that is not necessary? 100% of our forms. But I could solicit it through email and so in, the, in this. Or, okay, then 100% so, of our emails, 100% so that so that we you're saying 100 percent of right. what i i ask for does not does not do that because it's got to be measurable 
Again, this I don't believe that this one's conducive to that. Or we um, or we've got with, from a random sampling of communications with staff and students. Okay. I report that 100 percent of these did not. And again, in terms term, terms of this, just so people to help with the conversation. Um, in terms of the evidence piece, again, absence of evidence. The only information collected beyond what is normal and mandatory was a climate and safety survey administered last February. But it was used to inform the security upgrades as well as make programming decisions related to student behavior. Which I'm well, yeah. I, I agree with what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying, too. And that's why, for example, we asked for the climate survey. Because we thought that that was a measurable. There's no tie-in, so again, we're what getting is bogged down in a lot of information. Treatment it's of treatment of the staff. That's right, why but it's it means, But so, we need to have it more concise than, well, than hours of detail. He, it needs I, to be measurable. It, he can, and then if you if we have questions, he can pull it out and say, "Okay, here are all the responses," and we can see the. The data, you know, well, here are all the responses. <clears throat> but I think we need we need to keep him to numbers. It has to be measurable. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you do in policy governance. It's data driven. Right. Give us so the I, numbers. I disagree with, make with it that. measurable. I, I disagree with that um, statement that that's what policy governance is just numbers. I, I don't think that's what it is. It's holding somebody accountable through your policies. Right. And I think for me, when I'm talking about treatment of staff numbers aren't going to tell me anything. I want to know how the staff feel. When right. you go through a survey and all the staff are asked a certain amount of questions every year, we can look at. Right. And, and so we probably would have, if but we would have received that, that if, you, if we would have received that in several years ago, form. we would have knew that we known that we had a problem with our administration. We were not aware of that until Brent left. And then when we were going to hire him, all the communities talking about this huge problem we had. Because we weren't getting something like a but survey, we were just the, getting numbers. That was the staff. That was the staff. faculty. Faculty and staff. staff. But there wasn't a. I didn't see a huge drop. I didn't see a huge drop. The drop. You didn't see a huge drop from well, the two, from, for example, 2011 to 2016, where they were going there from were like 70 to 80 percent to 40 percent. In that, in the in distant that distant past. In the Remember, past. there was a four-year gap. So there were there were three surveys that were done on time. There was a four-year gap, and then there was. Mm -hmm. There was the old superintendents last year and then my first year. Right. Big right. gap. Big, big, big difference between those several years there. Right. We well, and why, why isn't it? I mean, that's again where every year the staff should be. They should be surveyed. We should be getting feedback from them. But we never have. And finally, we have. Right. And no, I think that's great. Am I and not providing as much as what? No, been you've no, been provi you're providing, providing what we asked for. Exactly. But, and I think, and the I'm difference, the jobs. meetings are going to be longer because we're doing the monitoring here. Right. And right. that was, right. that was a, a, you know. But our job is to be looking forward. Mm -hmm. I understand and, that. And if we operationalize and we, and we are data driven, there's, there won't be as much. I mean, there, we can have some, but this is an awful lot. And it's pretty detailed, and it's looking at at the past, and it's. But it's where not. Is, we, where is the part where we're looking at the future? Mm -hmm. And I hope we do an equal amount of looking at what are we producing? Well, are we getting the ends that we want? Right. What did That's What did really we spend we to do? half the time so far right. doing? Is talking about in in a large sort of wide range sort of way, looking at. What are, what are we hoping to achieve, and how are we working right. towards it? The, you know, we our job is to monitor a superintendent, and you know we're we're now sort of under the gun to decide right. what we're going to do. These are important, and I think you know I think it's okay that there's not just numbers. No, I'm right? not I saying wanted, just strictly this, numbers, but some. some but this is treatment of read, staff. When you read right. how we're supposed to be doing this. The interpretation needs to be measurable. I can't measure anything from the mm -hmm. from what's written here. There's no there's no measurement, and I, I'm just so. What would you propose to well, change I'll, it to? What, what I will do is I will grab the policy governance book again, and I will and I will I will bring it and and show you what I'm talking about because if you look mm -hmm. at it, that's what 
part of what we'll be able to do to just try and streamline things a little bit and keep us on track so that we can say we have we have a track record of doing this and we're seeing a trend but if we don't have any data to sort of show that and figure out a way to do it it's so it, it, it's, for for today, we, we we had asked Lane to do this. He, right. He's more than willing to provide us data. We just gotta know right. what data to ask right. for. Right, I know, and, and that's so what if I'm saying. What it's something that I would like to work on because I think we're still not quite there. And I would say yes, I agree. However, and we we don't know. We we can't just shoot down what we have no, because you don't I'm know not, what you I'm want. Not, I'm just Does saying, that make sense? I'm just saying. I still think we need to work on it. I, I think there's and I will and I will go back. I unfortunately I I was dealing with some family stuff, so I didn't have as much time. But I will I will take some time and I will look at it because I think if we're gonna still say we're we're operating from that a policy driven focus, we need to make sure that we have measurable data mm -hmm. and and we can do that for the ends, we need to do it for the monitoring. Everything needs to sort of be measurable, otherwise it doesn't mean a whole lot. The only, only comment I have is I'm happy to provide anything that you need, especially, and I'm in agreement that you know there need, needed to be more oversight and there should be more oversight, but I also don't want to get beat up for somebody else's past. No. Right. Right. So and I'm at not, times it feels like that. Right. I'm not trying to do that. <clears throat> and I don't believe that. But no, no I, I was, we talked about that. I was in, per, in full agreement that there's stuff that went on that you guys should have known about. And so mm -hmm. we had the discussion about, you know, how do we find a way to make sure that right. you're tracking. Um, and so that's, uh, I think that's an ongoing discussion. I don't think we've come to a... Nope. Of, uh, but you know, it's I'm well open to it. Well, and I just want to be clear about roles because you're running the school, and we are, and we are asking you to produce results. Yep. We need to be able to have a clear way to know that you're producing those results and you're doing it in a way that is legal, that's ethical, yep. that's professional, and we need to have clear data to show that. And as lay people on a board that meets once a month we we need to have enough information to feel comfortable yeah. that and that i and are. i i think things have changed a little bit i mean mm -hmm. i think um the piece one of the pieces that that um contextually that's missing um was the ends report you know there was a significant mm -hmm. amount of work done there was a significant amount of data that was pre presented um in terms of you know the reinterpretation of the ends and what we should be looking at for data mm -hmm. um and so that that will Continue, um, but you know there was quite a switch. I should, if you guys don't. Right, I went one. back and watched the the, yeah. the it, June meeting because well, the I last to one see. was October, so there was a oh, significant was amount of of okay. ends monitoring yeah. last yeah. last month. Yeah, but okay. So anyway, and I will, I will, I'm more than willing to work on it <laughs> because I think I I want to make sure that we are we are moving in that direction and we're not micromanaging. Our, our superintendent and we're keeping our, our roles clear um, in terms of what I mean what that we're going according to our to our policies um, not just sort of a willy-nilly interpretation of the of the policies but we're following them and he's aware of what what our expectations are so anyway so he presents these EO reports one month. You're more than willing to, more than able to go to the office, right? And, right. Yep. right, just and as I, always. Yep. But we're all responsible yep. for. Yeah, no, and I and I don't mind that. Okay, I, I mean that's great. Are there any other questions on these two reports? Okay. Do we accept it? We do, right? Because these were presented last month, so we've had a month to uh, do due diligence. Is there anything else you want to add? All right. Um, can I have a motion to approve EL Report 2.1? I'll make the motion to approve Reports 2.1 and 2.2. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Advocacy. Um, that one's really short. Um, it just kind of 
relaying what had happened at the, uh, the school board's association um, and the superintendent's association meeting in the fall meeting. Um, primary focus was on um, the changes to the state report card. And again, we kind of touched on that a little earlier. Um, there is a report card that goes out um, as part of the old No Child Left Behind um, law so that um, the community is aware of the performance of the districts and the individual schools. Um, that first one should be coming out this fall, summerish time, uh, excuse me, spring, summerish time. Um, when that comes out, I can give a full presentation of what the changes are. Um, a lot of it um, in the reinterpretation of the ends, um, a lot of that was built on what the changes are going to be for that report card to try to tie them up and make sure that they were supporting. What we're driving toward, what we're driving towards, is supporting you know that report card, and, and now it's going to make the district uh, appear to the community. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's it. Can I ask one question? So, what do you mean by the reinterpretation of the ends? So, the reinterpretation of the ends is uh, how I took it was just like the executive limitations. Is the board has a statement? There has to be an interpretation of what that means so that it exactly. can be measurable. Mm -hmm. okay. So that, that was done. That was a massive <laughs> project. Um, okay. And then it tied it directly to, to, to the data that was going to be used to measure that. Okay. And what was nice, there was a big preamble talking about the reason that this data was chosen was because it was objective, not subjective. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. You know, Nobody can go in there and manipulate it or make it look like something that it's not. So this is an example of what you, you, you were talking about. Before right. with Brent, we, we kept asking for, we kept literally asking for this exact thing, and it kept getting kicked down the, the road. And for instance, when that WCX article came out saying that we had, you know, a horrible, what was it, math scores. Right, And then right. we asked him in that meeting, and then it, he presented data, but we didn't, weren't able to use our ends to discern what was, Right, right. The ground truth. And so in this case, over the course of several months now, there are data dumps. Not, it's more, or I'm calling it data dump, but um, basically. <laughs> Hopefully it's somewhat understandable. Yeah. Yes, no, it is. It, it, it's where he's meeting the ends. And so it's exactly what you were just mm -hmm. talking about. Right. So it's no longer, I'm, I'm meeting the ends. It's here's the data demonstrated. Showing where we're right. at and what we're trying to. Right. I interpret it this way. Here's the data. This is the data that you this can use to measure. This is why I'm using this data. Yes. This is why I think it's the most appropriate data to be yes. using. Right. Yep. OK, good. And so that was awesome. going over August, September, and October, I think. Or, All right, yeah, I'll have to I go think. back and look at those meetings because I, I haven't had a chance yet. All right. Um, we need to approve the minutes from the October 8th meeting. I looked them over. I didn't see any um, changes that needed to be made. I don't know if anyone else noted anything. I guess we're only three of us there. All right, so can I have a, a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. I'll make the motion, okay? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> Superintendent's report. Anything else besides what you've already told us today? Most of it was included, I think, in your previous. Yeah, I think the, the superintendent's report really kind of focused on that, trying to trying to fix things upstream, um, mm -hmm. so that we're not, you know, having the giant jumps in, in budget later on as as time goes on. Um, there were a couple of um, incidentals that, that came up recently. Um, I sent an email out about one. Um, we received a communication from the town um, about the fact that they're going to be out investigating a water treatment, mm -hmm. um, stormwater treatment on the northern part of the high school property. Um, they showed up, you know, within 24 hours to do that work. There was no discussion or notification to us prior to that of even what it was about. Still don't know. Um, but I did check with PHO to ensure that I was right. They have no right to do this without board approval. Um, unless an easement was signed, I'm granting that, and I have requested of the town to provide us with the easement. And it's not that I'm against the work. I just don't know what it is. Um, mm -hmm. So Bob and Wes are reaching out to try to get a, an understanding. Because it's only appropriate to communicate about it clearly. 
Yeah. Well, and we have projects yep. in the in the in the works yeah. that it could, exactly. could affect. Are, which is the Raven, which right. is very close. You know, it's probably something stim simple like drainage, which is great, but mm -hmm. I don't know because we're not in the loop. So mm -hmm. I, I was a little taken back by that, but just mm -hmm. to keep folks in the loop. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, the other fun fun thing um, is the uh, the board member nameplates, they did a first run, they didn't like them, so they're, they're redoing it. <laughs> the, the eighth grade STEM class is doing all the work, oh, and they're nice. using the, the laser cutter um, <laughs> in the new makerspace that was built last year, so it's actually pretty cool. Um, Ken sent over pictures today, if I get around to it, I'll email them off to you, they're kind of cool. cool. That's yeah. fun. Very so neat. they're having a good time with that. That was it. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Anything we should note in particular about uh, the RTCC or principal's reports? Uh, no. Um, RTCC, the next meeting's on the uh, 15th. Um, and I had talked with uh, Jason about, you know, at least talking with that group about where his budget stands because there is an increased division. So okay. just to see how people felt about it. Eventually, that vote has to happen in this body. Right. To get that feedback. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Lane about anything in the packet? Any comment from? Either of you? Okay. <laughs> you guys are do you like the <laughs> opportunity to comment yes, throughout do. the meeting? Yep. Excellent. Good. I think it's a lot better than previous. Up front. <laughs> yeah. Good. Especially when you don't have anything to say. <laughs> you never no. I, I could mention on the, the stormwater, um, I was actually, my company, we put a, a proposal in for that. Yep. So I know a little bit about it. Oh. The um, those areas were designated by the Agency of Natural Resources. They did an inventory of the storm drainage for the town, yep. and they just found these areas around the town where they could do some green stormwater treatment. And that area at the end of the school was one of them that designated that they found where the drainage actually comes down through there. Yep. So there was other ones throughout the town, but that's I don't think there was any more. Done on that. Then. Do you know what the construction would look like if they built it? Is it actually a? I treatment? think it's going to be like a infiltration. Okay. Or or possibly, um, just a green trench. Yeah. Or a, a drain swale type of treatment. On yeah. It. No, I figured it was probably something simple, but it yes. just it was cryptic what we got. It was like, oh my! It made it sound like they were going to put you know the big wastewater treatment for sewage on. <laughs> like, you got to be kidding me! No, I know all the treatment was supposed to be um, green treatment. Yeah, so it's awesome. like an infiltration or uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, vegetative swale or something. Perfect. You just need to hear that. <laughs> how, how are the financials as we stand for this year? Um, usually, what I do with the financials is I take a look at the amount that's in there and I divide it by 12, and then that way I can kind of judge if we're on track. I mean, it's not perfect, um, but we're on track. So there's nothing. No that, surprises. No, no surprises, nothing abnormal yet. So. Okay. Board evaluation, which you did, Ann. I think we, I think we have our agenda this plan in an acceptable manner to focus on the real work of the board. <coughs> it wasn't all focused on the past. The board did, we followed our agenda and we did not get sidetracked in a commendable manner. The meeting was acceptably attended. <laughs> the board was commendably prepared for the meeting. I saw no evidence that any of us hadn't actually read the packets ahead of time. Um, we, did, we met our best expe expectations for proceeding without interruptions or distractions. We didn't get lost in an entirely different realm. Um, participation was balanced. We all participated, and not one voice dominated. Um, I felt that we met our best expectations in listening attentively when others were speaking, and we, and we treated each other with respect and courtesy, and that our work was accomplished in an atmosphere of trust and openness. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and we do have executive session. Okay, so um, I say good night.